Boom. Hey, folks. How's everyone doing this fine Monday? I know it's... Uh, hopefully a lot of people had the day off today, so that would have made it a... Um, you know, that would have made it a better day than usual. Um, if And for those of you who are celebrating, I hope you had a happy Easter. I hope you had a, uh, you know, and so forth. So um, I don't really understand. Like, I don't... I'll admit, I've never been sort of a religious person. I don't know the... I don't know the proper words and so forth for it. So... Um, Happy Easter, I guess. Um, yeah. Also, it's April Fool's Day. So, um, that's a thing. Um, a politician got me on an April Fool's joke by pretending to be dumb. And it tricked me because politicians do dumb things all the time. And I was getting really excited. They sent me that they had a really exciting, or that they had some plan to, uh, uh, go after the a different level of government. And I was like, ooh, I want to cover this. This is stupid. Um, yeah, they got me. Um, they got me. So, um, all right. How is, um, I hope everyone is doing, doing well here. Um, and yeah, it's, um, it's a, it's a good day. And, yeah, for me, Easter has always just about been about eggs, which is not really um, not really the usual thing. Now that I've annoyed several people in the chat, um, I hope everyone is. Uh, I know there's a lot of sort of different calls on your uh, attention today. So if you've decided to hang out here, thank you so much. All right. Now um, we got a whole bunch of different potential topics to talk about. And. I guess um, one of them that I got a whole lot of questions about is about Hawaii. And you might be saying, okay, Hawaii, why are you talking about Hawaii? Well, um, Hawaii is for some reason in the news because somebody is, somebody is suing out in Hawaii and the reason why they're suing, uh, the, what the news reports have said, is basically that there is a lawsuit because um, a building company can't read a map. And what maybe they were using Google Maps. And um, so, yeah. Um, it's not the spirit of Aloha. This is the spirit of I don't know where I am and I don't know what I'm doing. because. This company built a, a house, and not just a small house. They built a $500,000 house on someone else's property. Um, which is a stupid thing to do. Like, if you're going to build a house, and it's going to be $500,000 worth of house, you should build it on land you own. And so let's have a look. There's a whole lot of documents uh, and somebody saying, how did the owners not notice? The owners bought this piece of land, but they didn't live there. Uh, they bought the piece of land and they planned to, um, they planned to develop it later. They wanted to build some sort of retreat. By the way, I'm sorry, I'm bleeding a little bit. I shaved in a real hurry to get on, um, get on this. So, um, the owners wanted to build some sort of meditation, yuppie, hippie retreat thing. And they, they weren't like, they hadn't gotten around to it yet, but they were like, this piece of property is, is really significant to us. And we want to build on this piece of property that we bought at an auction for something like $22,000. I didn't know you could buy property on Hawaii anywhere for 22 grand, but yeah. All right. Let's have a look at what this one is about. Cause um, yeah, I see yuppie and hippie are very different. I, fair. Um, they got it on like tax things. So I don't know how they managed, but they got it surprisingly cheap. Okay. So what is happening? Well, 
Kiao. Um, I'm probably mispronouncing that. I am bad at Hawaiian terms and names and so forth. So um, Kiao Development Partnership versus everybody. They are suing Patrick John Lawrence. They're suing somebody's uh, PJ's Construction, Janelle Orajo, Robert C. Smelker, Annalene Malicia Reynolds. That's the actual property owner. So the property owner isn't the one who's suing. The property owner is, in fact, Kiao. Okay. Um, the property owner is getting sued here. Um, that's a problem. Um, and they're also suing the county of Hawaii and the um, heirs or assigns of Leora White Thompson, who I guess has died. So why are they suing them? Well, Kiao uh, Development Partnership is a domestic for-profit limited liability company here after the plaintiff, thank God, and is registered to do business in the state of Hawaii. The plaintiff is the record owner of the property known on the tax map as uh, lot 115. We're just going to call it 115 because that's going to be way easier. Being more particularly described as, and this is, guys, this is a land description. Um, land descriptions are obnoxious. And so, you know, it's got this big block of how they describe it. And um, subject, however, to the following. So these are things they don't own. Um, they don't own the mineral or water rights. That's very common. Um, they can't put in anything uh, racist in the title. That's probably Hawaiian law. Uh, road maintenance fees. Okay, fair enough. So that's the title. Um, defendants. Patrick John Lawrence is a contractor. Who does business is PJ's Construction. Annaline Militia Reynolds is the record owner of the property known on the tax county or tax map as lot 114. So you'll notice 115 and 114 probably right next to each other, right? So same thing with this big obnoxious thing. Um, resident of the state of California. Leora White Thompson is the prior record owner of 114, but she lost it due to a tax lien sale. So um, she owed tax money. She she had it sold. So uh, she may be deceased. Hence, they're suing her. She may or may not be deceased, apparently. So they're suing her descendants. Janelle M. Arajo is a corporation um, expired and involuntarily terminated. Okay. Um, defendant Robert C. Smelker is a resident of the state of Hawaii holding an architectural license. So an architect. Um, this sounds like this is everybody's fault except theirs. Like everybody screwed up except us. Nikki Crayon says that area is homesteads and recluses. If I can get property there for $22,000, um, I might want to go be a recluse on Hawaii. That actually sounds pretty cool. Um, what do I got to do to become a recluse? Um, does anyone know what's required for that? Cause, um, I could stand to be a recluse, I guess on, on Hawaii. That feels like a thing I could do. Um, I, Am I weird enough to be a recluse chat? Do you think that I could? Um... <laughs> no, she means spiders. Okay, fair enough. Um, I thought she meant like people who just want to be on their own. And um, yeah, uh, somebody says, I already have a good start on the hair to be a recluse. So um, fair. Um, so guys, I... Um, I've been playing some Stardew Valley and um, I, I don't know if you've been, if you guys have played uh, Stardew Valley, but there's a character in Stardew Valley who um, 
he's a homeless guy by choice. He lives out in the forest and he eats, um, you know, he eats foraged goods and out of trash cans and whatever else. And so uh, his name is Linus. So my wife came up behind me as I was playing and she was like, huh, he's got your hair. Because Linus has long white hair. And I was like, accurate, <laughs> accurate. So um, that was one of those moments where it was just like, oh, oh, um, I, I guess they, uh, I, I guess I got no argument on this one. So um, also, I got to see, do I have, do I have access to my own emojis? Um, I, I don't know. Do I have access to my, um, oh, Hey, I do. I do. Um, so we might have a new emoji. Um, all right. So, uh, let's have a, let's keep going here. Uh, plaintiff at engaged PJ to develop numerous vacant lots the plaintiff owned in Hawaiian Paradise Park. And one you didn't. In the past four or five years, they constructed at least 11 homes. They entirely relied upon PJ to build the houses from the ground up uh, in HPP, and PJ acted as both the contractor and the owner's representative on the project since plaintiff's principles were not on Hawaii Island. I bet that really endears them to the locals of Hawaii who um, are famously thrilled about um, famously thrilled about people who don't live on Hawaii um, buying up all the land. Um, <laughs> is that not accurate? Uh, somebody in the chat who's from Hawaii will have to let me know. Um, all right. This included locating the properties, pulling all respective permits, engaging subcontractors, and ensuring the subcontractors obtained their necessary permits through completion and final inspection. Okay, sounds like that might be a problem. They asked them to construct a house on 115. And um, they constructed an estimate form. Pursuant to this, they were required to do a bunch of details. Um including explaining verbally all lien rights, demand bonding. So basically the law says you have to do certain things and they didn't do the things. This is really important. Guys, there's a video I want to, um, and Stuart, you are absolutely right. This is going to be a claim here, unjust enrichment. If you are in law school and, you know, you will, um, this will, yeah, um, I'm from Hawaii, and that is very accurate. Hawaiians love people buying up all the land. Yep. I, I got to say, I um, I really enjoyed Hawaii when I visited, but the politics there, um, the politics are difficult. Like, I just kind of want to go visit and um, um, eat a lot of, oh, what's the, why am I, uh, of, uh, eat a lot of poke, which was fan-freaking-tastic. Um, but yeah, now this is stuff I want to do. There's a video I've been planning on doing for a bit. The video is, um, is basically the top five laws you, or top five, like sections of law you should read if you are a human who needs to, um, you know, who needs to know these things. Um, and it's not going to be number one, but definitely on top five is going to be consumer protection laws. Um, uh, Sarah, she's doing much better. She's downstairs watching some shows. She's watching something in French. Um, I don't know what it is, but um, so consumer protection laws are very important to read and understand. And often consumer protection laws will require certain rights that you have to be placed in, um, to be placed in, um, 
uh, like in the terms of something you're signing. So um, as an example, I got a security system and the security system, um, I, the, the people like I initially, uh, somebody says your wife speaks French. She does not. She's just watching a show with subtitles, but the show is in French. So, you know, it was required that they indicate certain things like a right to back out of the agreement within a certain amount of time. Now, um, somebody, um, somebody was asking, what is unjust enrichment? So unjust enrichment is basically you got some sort of reward or some sort of, um, you know, value, but you didn't earn it properly. And so as an example of unjust enrichment, let's say me and, I don't know, picking a random person from the chat here, I love pie. Let's say we make a, um, let's say we make an agreement where I am going to sell um, I love pie, um, I don't know, um, this half-eaten bottle of hot sauce um, which would be a bad purchase. I'm hopefully soon going to be able to sell f completely uneaten, like full bottles of hot sauce. But I agree to sell that for, I don't know, $500,000. She's paying, he or she's paying a ridiculous price. Um, and then it turns out that the contract is invalid. But we've already done the deal. Right, I've already sent off the the hot sauce, and I've got the half a million. Let's say you know, and for some reason the contract is invalid. Let's say I love pie is, um, let's say that they're like fifteen and can't legally you know be bound by the contract, so the contract gets canceled. But I'm still sitting on five hundred grand in cash money. And I love pie would like that money back, right? Um, so the lawsuit can't be based in contract because the contract was deemed to not be valid. And, but I, I have all this money that I shouldn't have. So what the lawsuit would be based on is unjust enrichment. I have all this money and I shouldn't have all this money that's the basis for it. So that is, you know, that's why that's there. So all of this is saying that uh, they were supposed to provide a written contract, which has all of this information. They didn't do that. This is saying they didn't comply with obligations. Now, this is good stuff to know. You got to know this stuff if you want to do anything. And I could let me tell you a little story time of... Um, little story time of my own experience. So I hired a guy. We had, um, we had a small flood. Um, basically our foundation had a leak. It was cracked. And so water came through. And because of that, we had to hire a guy to, uh, we hired a guy to replace some insulation that had gotten wet and had gotten moldy and re drywall. So we hired a guy. He did that. And we were like, fantastic. Anyway, um, the repairs to the foundation to make it watertight um, were, they didn't work. Um, so the foundation guys came back to do, uh, to do more work, right? And that was, that was fine. Um, like the foundation guys just came back to do it. The, the unfortunate thing is that we had to tear apart all of the, like the drywalling and so forth. And what we discovered is that we'd hired these guys to replace the moldy insulation, like the insulation that had gotten wet, and they had billed us to replace the moldy insulation. But instead, they just put the same insula insulation back in the wall. They ripped us off. And so I immediately stopped payment on the check. Um, and they got pissed off. They were, you know, threatening to sue me. And so I had to go in and dig up all of the problems with how they violated the law to be like, we don't got to pay you a damn thing. And in fact, they had done some other work that they did okay. 
So we paid them for that work, but we just refused to pay them for the stuff that they ripped us off on. And, um, but I had to do all this research and it would have been good if I'd done it beforehand. So, um, defendant Smelker, um, was listed as the architect. His name was on the permit application and Smelker would ad adhere to the county's buildings and zoning codes. Plaintiff is unaware of the terms of Smelker, Adrajo's, and PJ's business relationship or arrangement to know how they allocated risk amongst each other. Fair. Um, I was not a lawyer at the time. I was a law student at the time. I was not happy about that. Um, building permit was issued for 115 for a three-bedroom, two-bath dwelling with attached garage. There were also associated electrical and plumbing permits issued. Work began on what plaintiff believed to be 115. PJ located the lot and construction of residence began and PJ informed plaintiff of the same. So it sounds like they have a good claim against PJ construction, right? Because this is the development company. This is the, the company behind things. But PJ is um, PJ was responsible for figuring all of this out. They also say County of Hawaii inspectors visited the project numerous times with full knowledge of the permit for the resident was associated with 115. I'm going to guess that this is out in the middle of nowhere and that the lots are not like super obvious. Because if if I'm in the city and I need to know where the lot is, it's really obvious. But out in the like rural areas, not so much. And especially if it's undeveloped rural areas. So they cleared the various stage of the construction and let the project proceed. PJ constructed a residence and it passed the final inspection. And plaintiff paid PJ and his subcontractors approximately $300,000 to build the house. Thereafter, they marketed it for sale. They obtained a buyer and... During escrow, it was discovered that there was no house on 115 and rather that PJ had constructed a house on 114 adjacent to 115. This violated the Hawaii County building codes and zoning codes by building on the wrong, long, on the wrong lot. Not surprising. Um, so defendant Reynolds, the record owner of 114, purchased 114 through a County of Hawaii tax sale. and. This is interesting. This is, they say, the tax sale may have been defective, according to a title company, since the prior record owner may not have been properly served regarding the tax sale. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about tax sales. Tax sales are, um, tax sales are fun. Wild gaming, I have not covered that yet. We will get to that one. Um. Tax sales are fun. So let's say I owe the government a bunch of property tax. Well, um, the government is really good at getting property tax back. Um, and one of the ways they can do it is they can sell your property and, and you know, get the tax money that way. So um, that's, that's a problem. They can seize your land and, you know, and sell it. But because they're seizing your land, they're required to properly give you notice and to, you know, to give you an opportunity to pay your taxes, right? Before they sell your land, they should say, hey, before, like, you, you can pay your taxes. Because sometimes it can be like $5,000, right? And so let's say you owe $5,000 and the government is like, hey, do you want us to take your land or do you want us to just like, do you want to pay us the 5,000 bucks? Most people would want to pay the 5,000 bucks, right? So they're saying because that service wasn't done, maybe that, she might not legally own the land. And this is something that has happened to sit in situations where people have actually um, bought land that they thought was legally theirs and it turned out not to be. 
So yeah, there's some risk to buying um to buying land in auctions and these kinds of things. Uh, this is also why title insurance is worth uh is worth buying because title insurance um helps you avoid these things and that is um that is a good thing. Um, title insurance means that if there is some sort of problem with the title like this, that ultimately it's somebody else's problem. Like it's your, um, it's your insurance company's problem and you always want it to be somebody else's problem if you can. So, um, yeah. Um, Ferret funds, uh, Ian have daughter with ADHD, 19 years. We're having her getting a job. She's scared. Um, fair um now this is a this is a kind of case um i hope she does well um this is a kind of case that um that is going to make um property owner like uh property law profs very happy for a long time they're going to be just thrilled about um about this case because they love complicated um, tax scenarios and all of that. So, um, PJ got a notice of claim. They denied the claim. Their attempts to engage and follow through with mediation have been ignored. Don't in ignore those. That's a bad idea. That can, that can be a problem. So, um, breach of contract as to defendant B PJ. So, PJ breach of contract basically means we hired PJ to do the things they didn't do the things. Right. And that's, that's a problem. So what are the elements of a valid contract? Because of val like the first thing about a breach of contract claim is, do you have a valid contract? And so we've got ingredients of a valid contract. The first is offer i.e. did somebody offer to a deal to somebody else? The next is acceptance. Was that deal accepted? And the third is consideration. Um, consideration is did valuable things, which don't have to be that valuable. Uh, they can be very minorly valuable. People make contracts for small amounts of money um, all the time. Like, hey, um, I just finished eating like a little bit before I came on stream. So this like chewed on bone, I could sell that to somebody for a quarter. That would be a valid contract. Um, even though you might think that a chewed on bone and a quarter are both not worth a lot, valid contract because that's consideration. But you have no consideration in situations of gifts you have no consideration sometimes in situations where people try to pay you in stuff you already have. Um, sometimes people will try to offer you things you already have ownership of or already have rights to. So, um, yeah. I can't sell it to the pups. This is a cooked bone. It would not be, um, not be good. All right. So, plaintiff offered... To PJ to construct a residence. That's the offer. PJ accepted the offer and started construction. Plaintiff fully performed on its end of the bargain by P by paying PJ in full on all of the contract's term. That is basically, there's our offer, there's our acceptance, there's our consideration, there's our contract. Boom. This is clean pleading. I like this. This is, this is nice. I'm not actually selling the bone guy. All right, guys. Um, I see people going, how much for the bone? I'm not selling the bone. Um, so uh, they fully performed. PJ materially breached the contract by building the house on the wrong lot. Plaintiff suffered damages. Cool. Okay. Negligent misrepresentation, which is they identified that they had correctly identified lot 115 as a result of the failure to exercise reasonable care, um, including but not limited to hiring a freaking surveyor, which seems like a basic thing, um, caused a bunch of damage. Breach of fiduciary duty. Fiduciary duty. Um, sometimes you've got a duty of care to somebody. Like, I owe a duty of care to anybody who visits my house to 
make sure that my house is not dangerous, right? I need to make sure that, um, you know, that I have cleaned the ice off my stairs, right? That's that's a sort of ordinary duty of care. A fiduciary duty is actually a higher level of duty. You owe somebody a duty that may actually exceed your duties to yourself. So a fiduciary duty is a special kind of duty. It applies to lawyers representing clients. It applies to certain um, like uh, act, act financial advisors, trustees, all of these things. So they're saying PJ had a fiduciary duty because they acted as the owner's representative and were conferred with plaintiff's trust and money. So they say they breached on that basis. Okay, I don't know if that's the strongest claim, but it um, it's it's in there. It's a better claim. Um, somebody says I should Google Earth this area to understand how remote and rough it is. I take your word for it that it's pretty pretty miserable. Um, so um, let's see. Negligence as to defendant Smelker. Smelker, they say, owed a duty of care because he is the architect. So he should have figured out that this was the wrong land, so he owes on that basis. Negligence as to the defendant County of Hawaii. I think this part of the claim is probably not going to succeed for the simple reason that, um, for the simple reason that like states tend to immunize themselves from lawsuits. So, um, they say Hawaii owed the homeowner a duty or obligation, uh, requiring it to conform to a certain standard of conduct for the protection of or others against unreasonable risks by correctly and properly carrying out its inspections of construction projects. So basically, um, they are saying that uh, there was an obligation to inspect, that they didn't inspect properly, and that therefore they're on the hook for that reason. Uh, no, I'm not putting the bone up for extra life. <laughs> I'm going to throw the bone away. The bone would be disgusting by the time of that. So basically, they should have inspected it. They should have caught that the place was being built on the wrong property. And yeah. Deceptive trade practices. Um, basically, they say listed a licensed architect without ensuring he would conduct his due diligence. He, um, But instead, he just used his architectural license to stamp the plans and did none of the stuff required for architects. Okay, that's what that claim is. Unjust enrichment as to defendants Reynolds and Thompson and slash or her heirs. Here's should be heirs, but it says here's um, or assigns. So the unjust enrichment is basically they say plaintiff conferred benefits upon defendants Reynolds and Thompson, which included inter alia payment for the construction of a fully permitted re or permittable residence on 114 and that they were thus enriched, and retention of such is unjust. Plaintiffs Reynolds and Thompson have been unjustly enriched at the expense of plaintiffs and should be required to make restitution to the plaintiff in an amount to be proven at trial for damages. Now, let's talk about the unjust enrichment claim. Basically, the unjust enrichment claim is we, um, we built a house, and now you have the house and you shouldn't have the house because you didn't pay for the house. And so you don't get a free house. You need to pay us for the house. And this to me seems like an absolute. I think that this claim or this case should be a complete loser for a couple of reasons. First of all, the owner of this property did not want this developed. The owner of this property actually wanted it to be left alone and to build on it to her specifications, but she didn't want the existing, like the existing land to be uh, bulldozed and whatever else. She wanted the natural state of the land to stay as it was. So, um, this house is unwanted. This house is not like, yay, free land. This house is like, 
what the hell are you doing? Get your house off my land. And in fact, I think, and we're going to get to her, like to see if she's launched a counterclaim. I think that if I was her, I would be saying, listen, I want not only for to not pay you for this free house, I want to sue you for get your house off of my land, the cost of demolishing the house and the cost of restoring the land to its original state, which can be insanely expensive, insanely, insanely expensive because, um, like, let's say you knock down five or six trees. You know how much it costs to put trees back? It's not cheap if those trees are super, like, if those trees have 10 years of growth, super expensive. Um, so, um, that's a problem. Alternative relief, constructive trust as to defendants, Reynolds and Thompson and slash or, or heirs or assigns. So, um, a constructive trust is a situation where by operation of law, and this is complicated, you can end up holding something in trust for someone else. And here they say, accordingly, plaintiff is entitled to a constructive trust imposed on 114, and this court should exercise its power in equity to order plaintiff and defendants to swap and exchange lots subject to whatever terms the court de deems fair and equitable. This is also... Um, this is also a complete go yourself. Um, one of the things is that you, um, so she makes claims and we'll get to her things. She makes claims that basically this land is very significant because it's connected to the ley lines and the meridians and, all of this stuff. This particular piece of land is unique. And the thing is, is that the law actually recognizes the uniqueness of land. There's something where normally if you want to sue somebody um, for like a breach of contract, normally you can't get what's called specific performance. Specific performance is where the court says, give them the actual thing. So normally, let's say I sue Bob and because Bob has failed to deliver to me $100,000 worth of gold bars, which is probably like half of one. But, you know, he was going to give me $100,000 in gold bars and I was going to give him $90,000, right? The court isn't going to make Bob give me a block of gold. They'll make Bob pay me the difference. I paid him $90,000. The gold is now worth $100,000. Bob pays me $10,000, right? Cool. Um, everyone's happy. But there are some exceptions where Bob might have to give me the thing. And those exceptions are things like unique items. So um, artworks. If Bob is selling me the original Mona Lisa, he might actually have to give me the Mona Lisa or something like the Hope Diamond or... Um, you know, the actual Aston Martin used in a particular James Bond movie. This kind of thing with very specific uniqueness. But one of the very common ways to get specific performance is with contracts involving land. And the reason why is that land is not interchangeable. My property is not the same as the land next door. It's not the same, like it might be the same size lot and it might be that they're right next to it, but my property is not the same. And so this um, saying you should be required to swap properties is like, nah, bro, um, nah. Um, attorney's fees, they want their attorney's fees. Um, all right, and they've got a demand for a jury trial and all of that fun stuff. So... Um, you might think we're done with all of this. We are not done with all of this. Stuart says it's volcanic dirt. Sure, but it's their specific piece of volcanic dirt. So, yeah. 
All right. Um, let's look at some more on this because there's a lot of documents on this. PJ's construction, their answer to the verified complaint. So, um, first offense, they say it fails to state a claim uh, against the defendant upon which relief can be granted. Now, um, what is it? Um, this is, I kind of like the way they did this. We admit the allegations in the following paragraphs. We deny the allegations in the following paragraphs. Um, this is really common. Why do, why do lawsuits do this? Now, the other way of, of doing this is where they go through and they just go through number by number. Paragraph one, we deny the allegation in paragraph one. Paragraph two, we admit the allegation in paragraph two. And that is such a miserable way to read all of these things. Um, but basically, for any allegation that is in the statement of claim, you have to sort of answer it and indicate what it is. So um, you basically have to go and say, this is true or this is false. And the reason why is so that the court can narrow all of this down. Now, I'm just going to tell you um, what I do when I get something like this. And I don't do a lot of civil law, but I go through and I, I take three colors of Sharpie and I just mark the paragraph so I know on my copy what's been admitted and what hasn't. So, um, third defense, plaintiff failed to exhaust its contractual remedies. So second, um, are you going to say how, um, defendant by and fourth defense, they acted in good faith at all times. Fifth defense, the claims are barred by consent and slash or waiver or estoppel. Um, they're not elaborating at all on this. Um, Sixth defense, plaintiff has failed to mitigate damages. Seventh defense, the claims are barred by the applicable statute of limitations. How are they? How are they limitations barred? What time was this? Um, or are they just naming every defense and they're just going to say it? Um, 2018, when was this built? Uh, when was this built? Uh, when... 2021 versus so I mean there might be a limitations issue okay fair enough um it there might actually be a limitations issue um normally I'd explain why um plaintiff lacks standing to bring the present action that seems weird claims are barred by latches what is latches latches is basically a doctrine that says that you need to um you need to take proper steps. So as an example, let us say that the prosecution in a case I am running um, is uh, is arguing that um, they need an adjournment of the trial date. Um, I might argue that their claim is barred by latches if they failed to take alternate steps to ensure that they didn't need an adjournment. And one of the most common ways that latches might come up is if um, if they forgot to subpoena the witnesses or something like that. And that's based. So basically, latches is an argument of like, you guys screwed up. You didn't take the steps you should have been taking. And yeah. Can I talk about the haunted house of Nova Scotia? Um, I could if I knew anything about it. So uh, claims are barred by unclean hand. They're just they're just naming every defense. Um, so they intend to rely on affirmative defenses, including but not limited to accord and satisfaction, discharge and bankruptcy, duress, estoppel, failure of consideration, fraud, illegality, license, payment, release, res judicata, statute of fraud, statute of limitations, waiver, and any other matter constituting an avoidance or affirmative defense. Um, so basically they're saying we will claim every claim that we can. Um, based on the insufficiency of the allegations in the complaint, they can't formulate all of their defenses and reserve the right to include additional affirmative defenses. How? You just named everything. Um, plaintiff on. All right. So this is basically just they um, they want to cite every 
possible defense. Counterclaim. So they're going to have to actually make some allegations in the counterclaim. Um, counterclaim. Um, so KDP is a limited liability company. Why are they suing KDP? Why is PJ suing KDP? Um, longstanding agreement was that they would get paid for their um, material and so forth. And they say KDP has refused to pay them. Okay. Um, why would KDP refuse to pay PJ? Well, because they think PJ screwed up and built on the wrong lot. I would refuse to pay them too. Um, if that's what I thought, right? So, yeah. Um, basically, pay us for doing the work. Um, okay. Um, fair. That seems like a reasonable... Um, you know, thing and what are they owed? They're owed seventeen thousand, twenty-one thousand. Okay, um, so they want their money. They say, um, I feel like they have a problem on that because if they did build on the wrong lot and they were not supposed to build on the wrong lot, then they're going to run into some trouble. The county of Hawaii wants to dismiss the plaintiff's verified complaint, and. Um, so why do they want to do that? Well, um, they have the sort of introduction and this is basically, do we owe a duty? They say the county owes no duty. We are not under any legal obligation to conduct independent research. We don't do this, sir. This is a Wendy's is basically what they're saying. We don't have to do our own. We don't tell you whether you're building on the right lot that's your job you instead have to um um you have to do that so we just looked at the house and said does the house meet standards it's a perfectly fine house so yeah um that is that is on you so basically they're saying that uh, because of that lack of duty that there's no uh, requirement there that the uh, claim against Hawaii should be thrown out. So um, that's that. Um, plaintiff alleges that uh, they could have made $200,000, $300,000. Um, but yeah, you can't just uh, reclaim that. Okay, so that's their conclusion on that one. We're going to sort of go through, and it may be pretty brief on many of these documents. There's a lot of documents. But we're going to go through um, at least the substance of what's going on because a lot of people have asked me about this one. This is, this is a case of a Hawaii company who built, their, built a house on someone else's land. Um, so, architect architect here um so uh defendant robert c smelker's answer to the plaintiff's verified complaint what is the architect's defense he's a design professional and he's entitled to proceedings before a design claims conciliation panel i you should have taken this to a different kind of court first and this actually can be fatal because sometimes you are required to do that as a first step. So that might be interesting. Second offense, perform no worker services directly for the plaintiff and perform services only for HPM building supply, i.e. we don't have a contract. I got a contract with B and B has a contract with you, but we don't have any contract between the two of us, so... Yeah, that's actually also potentially a good issue. They're suing the wrong people. Um, fails to allege facts, circumstances, or uh, events to uh, for necessary elements of its claim for release. Fails to state a claim. Uh, basically, fails to state a claim is basically just um, like, okay, even if all of the things you say are true, so what? You still lose. Um, you still lose. And Katie Cotton says, architect's wife says bullshit. Fair enough. Um, so, 
Uh, so many people who should have noticed that they were wrong admit till the house uh, admit took till the house was finished. I mean, the one person, um, Waylon, we haven't gotten to that yet. Um, the one person who really couldn't have done anything about this was the property owner because they weren't actually there. They weren't actually like there at all. So six defense barred all or in part that the alleged injuries were caused um, by persons or entities other than Smelker. Um, economic loss doctrines. So you can't just sue for uh, the money you hope to make. Uh, statute of limitations made without reasonable inquiry and are not warranted uh, by existing law or evidentiary support. And yeah. Um, Failed to mitigate its damages. Doctrines of... St okay, they're citing everything. Did not provide adequate notice or provide reasonable opportunity to cure. How would you have cured this, Mr. Architect? Would you have built them another house? Like, I don't know what the deal is there. Um, all right, so they're just basically citing every defense that's available. Cool. I hate state... I hate defenses that just, like, cite every possibility um all right uh pj lawrence does an amended answer to complaint but it is the same bs so we're not reviewing it because it is just the same we deny everything and cite every single you know possible argument all right here's the one i was looking at that is uh, most important um defendant annaline militia reynolds by and through her attorneys, D. Pascal and Summers, LLP, she is the property owner. She, This is the person whose land it is. Um, she doesn't have knowledge or sufficient information to form a belief about everything. She denies a few things, denies a few more things. No response um, is necessary for a bunch of them, but she denies them to the extent that she can. Okay. Um, what are her defenses? She's not been unjustly enriched as she did not request consent to or benefit from the construction of the house on her property. She actually views the house as a negative, right? She views the house as a negative, like as a detraction. So she's not unjustly enriched. Um, a constructive trust is not a, an appropriate remedy as she's not been unjustly enriched and is not engaged in any wrongful conduct. She didn't do anything wrong to establish a trust. Um, and a trust is normally based on some sort of wrongdoing you might have engaged in. So, yeah. Um, so, injury or damages were not caused by her conduct, which to me seems like this makes 100% sense. She didn't cause any of this, right? None of this. Um none of this was caused by her, right? There's nothing she did to make this happen. There's nothing she did to make anything like that. Um, she has no contractual relationship, so they can't sue under a contract. Plaintiff failed to mitigate its damages, say by building on the right property, uh, barred by the doctrine of unclean hands. I think that this is actually one that is, the unclean hands here actually makes some sense. You guys are the people who screwed up and you want to sue us? No. Um, so plaintiff acquiesced or consented to. Basically, everything should fail. It's their own wrongful conduct. Yep. Barred by the doctrine of latches, waiver, and collateral estoppel. Um, certainly latches, like you screwed up. Um, their complaint as against her is frivolous contains misrepresentations of fact and um the it because it lacks legal merit constitutes frivolous conduct this this part here right here this bit this is not just a defense this is also putting the development company on notice this is putting the development company on notice of if you want to keep suing me I'm coming after you for sanctions. I'm coming after you for punishment. Um, that the plaintiff's complaint was filed and is being continued in bad faith and to harass 
the answering defendant. The plaintiff's complaint was filed and is being continued in bad faith and without any reasonable basis in law or fact against the answering defendant. What would justify this? Well, um, one of the things that would justify this is that the plaintiff has actually been asking the um, the defendant here, they asked the homeowners, could you, uh, would you trade properties with us? And so the argument she can make is, listen, you guys are trying to force me to trade properties because, uh, you know, in order to deal with this. Um, and this is pressure to make us have to trade properties. The other thing that is of worth noting here is that by adding this house to her property, they've taken it from a property that she bought for like $22,000 to one that is now arguably a half million dollar property. And what happens when a property goes up by basically half a million dollars? The tax implications go up. So she now has to pay taxes on a half million dollar property which is a lot of money. And what can she, like, I would think that the immediate solution I would have to my property going up a half million dollars based on some jack hole building a, a whole house on it is, well, cool. I could take its value right back down by bulldozing the, the house. But she can't bulldoze the house while she's tied up in this litigation or else she'd be in a whole bunch of headaches. So now she's got all of these obligations to maintain this house she doesn't want, and she can't knock it down because the court might say that's improper, you owe for it. She's really been put into a bad situation there. So she's unhappy. That And can you blame her for being unhappy? I would be unhappy too. Um that is a real, um, yeah. So, um, lots of people have said she should be suing them. Um, great news. She is, she is suing them. So she's got a counterclaim. So her counterclaim states she's the res she's the lawful owner of this property. Um, basically all of this says due to an inexcusable error, plaintiff had the house constructed on Reynolds' property instead of plaintiff's property. She was not aware of this unauthorized uh, construction until after its completion. It's been reported by news organizations that, um, you know, that she, basically she found out about this with tax obligate, or when essentially they reached out to be like, hey, um, hey, by the way, um, we can can we like trade properties? So she wanted to build a two story home for her children, providing them with a legacy and a view of the ocean from the second floor. But upon learning of the construction, Reynolds was informed by a real estate agency and a title company that the house built on her property was in escrow and to be sold by plaintiff. Reynolds did not authorize consent to, or have any knowledge of the construction plans or process. So basically they were trying to sell this land and she's like, she's like, whoa, you can't sell my house out from under me. So, yeah, she is suing for a whole bunch of things. And yeah. So she has sustained various damages, deprivation of her property's use and enjoyment. She can't build her house there because they're, they've got that one. Um Oh, and this is a good point. Now that she has services such as electric and sewage, her taxes will not go down after demolition. Ooh. Um, yeah. Uh, the financial burden of having to demolish and remove the unauthorized construction, it costs money to knock a house down and a decrease in her property's market value. Um, that arguably went up. She's encouraged substantial legal and professional fees to address the trespass, Costs associated with securing the property. What does this mean? Um, when you have a house that is now left empty, people have been coming in to try to squat on this property. So, and she's had to, she's had to keep them out. She says people have come in there and were like pooping in the house. Um, you know, yeah. 
the emotional distress linked to the invasion of her privacy and security, and environmental damage requiring expenditure for restoration. So she wants money back. All right. Um, created a nuisance. Um, I don't know if this is properly a nuisance. Nuisance is normally a notion where something is escaping your property and ending up on someone else's property. So, like, let's say you have a building that produces a lot of garbage and that garbage ends up on somebody else, like it blows in the wind. That could be a nuisance. Um, so she's repeating the damages. Negligence. Basically, you guys had a duty not to build on land you didn't own. So, and you did. So, yeah. Um, she's also suing for um under uh hawaii law for attorney's fees where the actions taken by a party are frivolous i.e you guys have brought a frivolous lawsuit against us we want our full attorney's fees doesn't seem unreasonable here um prayer for relief she wants the monies all the monies so yeah the people who said she should be suing you are correct. Um, she also sues um, she also sues PJ's construction for basically the same stuff. like you built a house on my property. you owes me the money for that. Um, I'm not gonna go through that one because it's basically the same thing. Um, she basically says, why why are you building on my land? Um, you might be wondering, why do you sue all of these people? Why do you sue everybody? Um, you sue everybody because what you don't want is a situation where the court says you forgot to sue somebody and that person owes, like, let's say, um, let's say Bob, Frank, and Steve are all people who may have wronged me together. And I decide for whatever stupid reason, I to sue, decide to sue Bob and Frank, but not Steve. If they decide that Steve is responsible for 75% of the loss, then I am not getting set. Like that money is gone. Um, I can't get it back from Bob and Frank. So, yeah. Um, so Steve basically, like, that's a problem. I got to sue Steve as well. All right. Um, yeah. Um, was it? Uh, she also has a defense against um, PJ's construction, who is suing her. She's getting sued by everybody. Um, and yeah, um, it's it's going to be a big thing. Um, now, I have heard reports from sort of the news that basically have said that um, one of the reasons why they didn't get a surveyor is that surveyors cost money and they didn't want to pay that money. And that is the worst thing. Like lawyers all the time have to deal with a situation where um, people don't want to hire a lawyer. And so they want to get a contract together, but they don't want to hire a lawyer for it. And, um, and usually it's like, we don't want to hire a lawyer because the lawyer is going to cost $2,000. And so, um, you know, as a real common example, you get people who want to start a business. Um, and they say, hey, we're just going to, instead of going to one of those expensive lawyers who cost 2000 bucks, we're just going to have a handshake agreement between the two of us and we're such great friends, it's never going to cause a problem. Well, um, that's fantastic if the business fails. And fails in a way that nobody owes any money. Um, well, actually, there's basically two situations. One, the business fails and they end up owing money. And now they fight over who's left holding the money owed bag. Or the other terrible thing that can happen to these two people is that their business succeeds. So let's consider this example. Me and Bob 
decide to form an organization. Um, we decide we're going to start a new YouTube channel. It's going to be a new YouTube channel. Bob's going to do the research and I'm going to do the talking. And together we are going to, um, you know, we're going to run this new channel. And so let's imagine that this channel doesn't get to like a quarter million subscribers, which is where I am. Let's imagine that this channel gets to um, 3 million subscribers. 3 million. It's pulling in huge freaking money. And now Bob says, listen, I know we've been splitting things 50-50, but um, I do all the research. And that's really important. I should be getting 60-40. And I go, well, Bob, I can hire anybody to do the research. I'm the face of the channel. If I go away, the channel goes away. So I want 60-40. And we have nothing written down. And now we're in a fight. Because now I claim like, hey, we always said that I'd get 60-40 later down the road. And now we're in a big fight. Um, whereas the way you avoid this fight is if you actually have the agreement at the beginning. And this applies to like getting a contract. This applies to getting a surveyor. This applies to getting like title insurance. I got title insurance um, on this property when I bought it. And it we didn't end up using it. We didn't end up using it at all. Um, but it was nice to have because if you get into this kind of problem, then you want to have the title insurance. So there's lots of situations where there's just um, a little bit of spending at the outset can save so much trouble later on. Bob's research is from Wikipedia. Yeah, who would do that? That would be terrible. Um, so, <laughs> is this example low-key shade at Trials of the Century? I mean, it is now. <laughs> uh, it is now. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, I'm not getting into all the details, but yeah. Um, so, um Let's do some super chats. Uh, I'm going to do a swoop and then super chats and then swoop again. Um, classic swoop. Uh, Ron Klotzer towards your retainer for this evening. Thank you so much. Uh, pigeon business. <laughs> I love it. Uh, one month membership. Thank you. Uh, Ohio Paw Mom. I don't do Easter, but get bunny pics with the dogs. Um, we have rabbits here in Edmonton, and I can tell you the rabbits um do not come into uh into my um into my land because the um the dogs will chase them there is however a cat and this cat um so this cat is being a giant dick and let me tell you about this dick of a cat the, the cat by the way is super cute um and i don't know whose cat it is but we have this little construction uh, that is used. It's over our um, over our barbecue. So that if you want to barbecue in the rain, you can barbecue in the rain without it getting rained on. Anyway, this cat loves to hang out on this on this barbecue roof and is like, um, hey dogs. Bet you can't climb up here. F you, dogs. F you, dogs. And the dogs are like, come down here and fight us, cat. Or probably more like, come down here and play, cat. Because they're not like super angry. They're just like, we want to play. And um, the cat is messing with them. Now, what does that end up meaning? It means that the cat is messing with us. Because the dogs bark at the cat. And the cat isn't bothered. The cat is 0% bothered. Um, but we're bothered. <laughs> like, we're bothered. Um, what happened with the moldy insulation job thing? Um, he, we canceled his payment for the, the insulation part of it. 
and um, he threatened us, and I told him that his threats were hilarious, and that was that was that. Um, Pink fuzzy cow. I didn't know there was drama with trials of the century. Um, it was a whole big thing on Twitter for like uh, two weeks. So um, there's a couple of issues there. So yeah. Uh, April Fools doesn't hit the same when people on the internet lie every day. Happy Monday. Glad to spend time with you in the Law Nerds, Ian. Thank you. Although Law Nerds is really Emily's thing. So I don't really have a name for my chat. I should figure that out. Uh, Pigeon Business. After seeing you talk about them on stream a few weeks ago, I have recently purchased two IFACs for myself. One to keep in my truck and the other to keep at the barn. Take with me when I go riding. That is an excellent plan. Um, so IFACs basically are... Um, so for people who don't know what an IFAC is, um, there are basically medical um, kit, like you buy those first aid kits that are for, um, and most of those are for what I'd call boo-boos. Like you buy a first aid kit and it's full of like little tiny band-aids and stuff like that. Well, that's fantastic if you happen to have like a little tiny cut, but most people aren't thinking that they have a first aid kit um, like you're not thinking like I need a first aid kit for like when you cut yourself shaving. Cause like I got a couple of cuts from shaving and I don't need to put, I don't need to put like, you know, a band aid on it. IFAX on the other hand are for when stuff has gone really bad and you need a kit to not die. IFAX are your please do not die. I don't want to die today kit. So IFACs include things like, um, uh, they include things like a chest seal. They include things like uh, tourniquets. They include things like, um, you know, Israeli bandages or quick clot, that kind of thing. Um, all of those things. So um, IFACs are basically for, um, you know, for real emergencies. And they're just a little sort of quick thing. Um, there's a time and a place for like a little, you know, a boo-boo bag. But um, it's also good to have something for real bad shit. And so I want to get... Um, I want to get stuff like... Um, you know, I want an IFAC ideally for my range bag. Right now, I've got one IFAC to split amongst multiple places. I want to have one for my range bag, one for each of my and uh, Mrs. Runkle's cars, uh, one for the shop. So, um, yeah. Got a gun in there, too. Not in Canada, I'm afraid. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Tess, thank you for the, uh, the $10 donation there. It's much appreciated. And Canonical Heat, thank you for the 20 gifted memberships. Uh, Stuart, uh, Tamanaha, Volcanic Land. Yeah. Um, I think that's referring to the land they bought. And if it's volcanic, does that mean it's in like the volcanic, like the places where you can't get insurance in, um, Hawaii? Cause I know several parts of Hawaii, you can't get, um, like you can't get insurance for, um, um, uh, you know, for like you can't insure your land because, hey, it, it's going to burn down. Um, lava, you know, volcano going to take your your land. So, I mean, if that's the case, then that's not great land. Um, yeah. Musings of Apathy. Looking online, there's a few three-acre plots for around 36K. Ooh. Uh, Fiona W., thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. And uh, Canonical Heat, I got to play this. Make Runkle mad, make it rain. Also do the YouTube things and appreciate the fantabulous mods. Thank you so much, Canonical Heat. And for the people who don't get the uh, the reference there, I was saying, never tell the internet what makes you mad because they will do it all the time. And so the thing that makes me maddest is cash donations. So, um, yeah. Um, what is it? Uh, Elf loving sparkle for hurt lawn herd. Love the username. Uh, member for 14 months. Awesome. Nicholas Starho. 
Justice for bone, bone for extra life. Oh God, we're not making that a thing. Um, pants, extra life bone. I. It's actually a pain in the butt to s send like a bone somewhere. Uh, mispronounced name. Thank you for the YouTube membership. Much appreciated. Um, ferret funds. Ian, what should, what advice can you give to a 19 year old who's in college, but trying to enter the workforce uh, to help pay for college? They're having issues with change. And I think that you mentioned that this is um, not just sort of everyday 19 year old, but also one with um, some attention deficit issues. It's tough. You've got to, um, you, when you've got attention deficit, you've got to find a job that works, um, you know, works for you and works with uh, sort of your abilities and limitations. Cause if you find one that plays to your strengths, then it's fantastic. And if you find one that um, that doesn't, it's gonna it's gonna suck. Now, guys, I need to mute for just a second. The reason why is because I have this thing. This is my alternative to compressed air, and it's super noisy. But I have a hair stuck in my mouse, so I'm gonna mute you guys for just one second because. I need to use this thing, which otherwise will blow out everybody's eardrums. So one second. I totally forgot to mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Cat asked, just curious if there are any updates to the GWAX lawsuit. I don't think that there is an update there. Um, so that looks way more effective than my little $15 rechargeable duster. It is a fantastic, um, it is a fantastic little uh, device. Uh, so, oh, it was muted there. I did mute. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Dylan Schultz during Hagen Dawes and Frozen Gladi Limited, the defendant used the unclean hands defense as both ice creams pretended to be Scandinavian. Um, and in case you're wondering, I think both of these are about as Scandinavian as sashimi. So, yeah. Um, replay crew tonight, but I hope everyone has a good week. Thank you for the uh, the wishes and the uh, the uh, the donation there. Musical Soup, thank you for the super sticker. SF in Texas, uh, thank you for the membership. Joy W101, upon information and belief, Bob and Steve are jerks. Yes, they are. Your chat name suggestion, Law Elves. I also saw a lot of people saying Runkletarians. So uh, Against the Tide says, I vote we are called Runkletarians. Everyone, don't forget to like and to help Ian with reaching his pro bono dreams. Thank you so much. Um. Laura Christine, thank you for the five gifted memberships. Much appreciated. Boppet says, making Ian mad and pup snacks, but nothing for that darn cat. That darn cat seems to be doing all right. Phoenix, wow, 15 months. Glad to have you. Uh, bus stop person number 27. May everyone have an awesome week. Thank you so much. And uh, again, with making everyone have an awesome week. Uh, make leather bones for the auction. That's not a bad idea. I got to get back into the leather workshop. Um, and the other thing... So Logitech, I keep trying to hassle Logitech into um, into um, uh, they're making a, a, a webcam that I want. Uh, and the webcam is uh, this thing that uh, is basically designed for sitting above stuff. I don't know if you've seen my shop streams, but my shop streams, I don't have a good setup for uh, webcamming my leatherwork stuff. Um, so I really want to, I want them to get that damn webcam out. Um, I keep trying to convince them that they should send me one, but so far they haven't been willing, but I want that thing bad. I want it real bad <laughs> and it's not out yet. I'm like, give me a preview. Dang it. All right. Um, Let's talk about some other stuff here. There's uh, a bunch of stuff that was going on. Um, I am just trying to pull up. Where did I put that bloody video? Um, 
Oh, hey, um, let's. So I did a, um, I did an interview. Um, I did an interview with um, Jack Beeston. And Jack Beeston is one of the lawyers who is suing. Um, he's uh, suing Andrew Tate, or he's not suing Andrew Tate. He is part of the law firm uh, that is has been hired to sue Andrew Tate in the UK. And so they sought and got a warrant for Andrew Tate that had him briefly rearrested. I've got the hiccups. That's not fun. And so um, one of the things I um, and, you know, one of the things that came up in that one was that um, how they figured out that they should get a warrant for him, because the issue was this, you know, Andrew Tate might be leaving Romania. So let's watch the video. Um, um, and guys, I hope we don't get a, a, a takedown here, but this is an individual by the name of Aiden Ross. And this has been confirmed by Jack Beeston as how they, how they knew to tell the Romanian government that, you know, that he might, that Tate might be fleeing. Um, so Jack Beeston, you know, was able to confirm this and this is, yeah. Now, Aiden Ross um, is famous for being a friend of Andrew Tate, but also for sniffing his chair. So, yeah. Andrew had hit me up. He said, hey, I'm going to be uh, leaving Romania soon and probably never coming back. If you want to come over and do a week of long streams and content before I leave, I think it'll be big. And it's never it's I'm sorry. He said it's not. It's basically now or never. So what is this guy doing? Well, um. He is clout chasing by reading Tate's um, Tate's messages on stream. And I got to say, um, if I send you a DM and you read it on stream without asking me permission first, I am never sending you a DM again. Like that is the end of our communications. Um, that's that's the end of it. So, um, yeah. Now, this is terrible snitching. Uh, he's basically, t like, he, he's ratting out his friend here. And I also got to say, if I was on bail and you're doing, and somebody went on a stream saying, hey, um, he's planning on jumping bail, we would not be friends again <laughs> or anymore. Um, so... You know, and, you know, and, and this is just, I told you guys this year, you know, it's a week of content, right? Um, and again, guys, this might be the last time we ever do this. So it's kind of like, we got to take advantage of it now because, hey, bro, it's, it's, it's just, it's basically like, yeah, it's like that. So, um, that was, that was incredibly stupid. <laughs> that was, um. That was incredibly, incredibly stupid in a way that is just like, wow. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if I was Tate, I would tell. Um, I'd be telling this guy, like, lose my phone number. Um, but. I don't know if he did like, but yeah, that'd be where I was. Um, all right. Let's um so let's instead move on and look at this. This is Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Now, um we covered uh previously uh Hannah Gutierrez Reed's lawyers uh they submitted an application for um basically for a new trial. Oh, I'm being told I gotta swoop. Swoop. Swoop, swoop, swoop. Where are is my swoops? Swoop. Lives is shorter. That is true. So, um, what is it? The uh, what ended up happening is that um, Hannah Gutierrez reads lawyer Mr. Bowles, who is. Um, 
how do I put this? He's not doing a great job for Hannah, but he basically says, I found this new case and this new case guarantees a new trial for Hannah because it says that you can't do in an and or connector in jury instructions. And that is not what the case says. That is not what the case says at all. What the case says is that you can't do an and or connector in jury instructions where that and or connector would cause the jury to include or to have a path to conviction per the instructions that is not a path to conviction in the law. And so we basically have two different cases that apply, and both of these cases are still valid law. And the one situation is the Taylor situation, which is, was a situation where they had and or four different things. And one of those things allowed, or actually a couple of those things allowed for the potential that a juror could read that and decide that they could convict based purely on, um, on something like that they took the kids in the car, that that was enough to convict. Um, so that was one uh, one thing there. Uh, the other thing is that um, the Godoy situation is uh, that you can use and or to connect two different offenses if it's like path A to conviction or path B to conviction, but either of those is a valid um, is a valid conviction, right? So that's fine. Now. Hannah is in the Godoy situation. Hannah is in, that's where she is. And um, so, but Bowles doesn't understand the distinction. Bowles does not recognize the difference. Bowles thinks that the Taylor case stands for the proposition that any and or connector uh, is invalid. And we'll see that. Now, I am just going to comment on one thing. I'm just going to comment that Hannah actually looks really good for someone in prison. And I'm not saying that like in a creepy, like I, you know, I want a piece of that kind of way. That's not, that's not it at all. Um, I'm just saying most people in custody look like shit. Um, they look awful. Being in custody is not good for you. Being in custody, um, I've had numerous clients who I thought were like nearly dying and then you get them out of custody and they, they look much better. She's looking healthy. Um, I don't know who's doing her hair, but that she's, she actually, I think looks better in this than she did in the video of her on the rust set. Like she's um, so, And then I accidentally unplugged my mic. She's looking, she's looking decent. Um, so I, I'm kind of impressed. Like most of my clients do not look this good when they've been spending time. In and also the Godoy cares read. All right. We're just going to take it to the beginning here. All right. Let's have a watch here. Morning. The matter I'm calling is D101 Sierra 202340, State of New Mexico versus Hannah Gutierrez. Party state your name. I'm being told I'm on the wrong mic. I'm on the wrong mic. Um, guys, can people hear me? Can people hear me? And hopefully I don't sound like trash. Um, uh, Carrie Morrissey on behalf of the State of New Mexico. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning Your Honor. Jason Bowles from Ms. Gutierrez Reed. Now, let's talk a little bit about backgrounds. Uh, this is an entirely, this is a tangent. So, um, I have one computer room. And I can tell you that I have multiple options for my background. Um, option number one is this room as it is. And I'm going to tell you, I am cautious about this room when I'm doing remote court appearances for two reasons. One. Reason number one, I got a big gun on my wall. It's it's a painting of a gun. 
but it's a big gun. And some judges don't like that. I actually had a justice of the peace who gave me tremendous grief over the gun in my background. So that's option number one. Um, option number two, uh, well, and problem number two is I got all of this stuff. And you guys who watch my chat, um, you guys know all of this, right? You know what the story is about this stuff, or at least most of it. Um, so that's not ideal for some court appearances. It's fine for what I'm streaming, maybe not ideal for this. So um, your options for this is either one, you can um, you can have a sort of very curated background where you keep a background that, um, you know, that where everyone is able to watch. I need to, by the way, I need to paint this. I need to like paint my walls so that they're a different color because um, the like my hair on the white is just not working. I need like a dark blue in here. Um, so that's one option. Option number two um, is you blur the background and that's fine. Now, I, when I'm doing things, I either blur the background or I put up a virtual background or I go full hog. And full hog is I got a green screen behind me and I can throw up the green screen. And the green screen can be all sorts of fun because um, when you have a green screen going, you could put anything behind you. <laughs> and um, that's fun. Um, so you can actually have like, you can have bullet points behind you in the, you know, in your room or whatever else. So, um, but yeah, you can see the different choices. Bowls has a very carefully curated room and, um, you know, Carrie Morrissey has, uh, has the blur on. Good morning. And good morning, Your Honor. Monica Barreras, also present for Ms. Han um, Gutierrez Reed, who appears in custody. Uh, Mr. Bowles will be handling. And she's got a different choice. That's not an artificial blur because you don't see the edge. Um, that's just the camera on a uh, on a near focus, and she is doing what you should. I tell people don't do this. Um, now she's just appearing just to watch, but she's on a laptop, and the laptop is pointed up at the fluorescent light behind her, which means that everything is washed out, and it's nostril cam. Don't nostril cam if it's for business. Like, camera should be at eye level or above, never below eye level. Otherwise, all we get to see is your sinuses. And we don't need to see that. In the hearing this morning. All right. Go ahead. Your Honor, thank you. Uh, Judge, I wanted to touch on um, some principles in the... Bowles, I think, is also using a laptop camera, but it's a better quality laptop camera. And it's it's propped up, so it's aimed upwards. Um, so yeah, Taylor opinion this morning and also the Godoy case, uh, in light of the jury instructions provided at, at this trial, um, uh, judge at the time of trial, none of us had the benefit of the Taylor opinion, which as this court knows, came out after the jury verdict. So I first want to talk about the jury instructions given, which this court is aware, uh, there was a jury instruction yeah, given in 12 a that gave the jury two alternatives, um, connected by an and or connector and those two alternatives were the alternative theories uh, for involuntary manslaughter that the state had advanced at trial and this is exactly what godoy says is fine godoy says this is okay godoy says this is an appropriate jury instruction and um so I don't know what his problem is. Like, Godoy says this is fine. Um, he doesn't understand the case he's citing, and that's that's a real problem. So, yeah. So <clears throat> the instructions provided that the jury could find Miss Gutierrez-Reed guilty under either alternative theory connected by an and or. Uh, following the jury verdict, the Taylor opinion came out, and, and there's an important... Um, the other thing is when you've got like a, a background, think about how you blend in with your background, because it looks like Bowles is wearing a very tiny, very pointy hat. And yeah. Important 
several principles in the Taylor opinion, and we cited that in the reply. The first one I want to read is from paragraph nine of that opinion, which states that specifically defendants argue that the instructions listing the elements of essential conduct with an and or conjunction provided for alternative ways for the jury to find the defendants committed child abuse without requiring the jury to unanimously agree on any of those alternatives. Applying a de novo standard of review, we agree with defendants. So he's quoting one bit out of context, but he's not getting the full thing. And Judge, then I want to go down to paragraph 16, uh, which I've excerpted, where the court indicates that this violated our teaching in the console opinion, 2014 NMSC 030, that when two or more different or inconsistent acts or courses of conduct are advanced by the state as alternative theories as to how a child's injuries occurred, then the jury must make an informed and unanimous decision guided by separate instructions as to the culpable act the defendant committed and for which he is being punished. And so, Your Honor, our argument under that principle is that we had two different acts in this case. The first act being that she loaded a live round into a gun that was supposed to have inert ammunition. And the second act was that she did not uh, allegedly perform an adequate safety inspection of that firearm. Based on those two paragraphs in Taylor, there should have been separate instructions and there should have been the requirement that the jury unanimously find which act it was, which theory it was, that they said she committed. This is exactly what Godoy said is fine. Like, he doesn't understand the case that he's looking at. He didn't, I don't know if he didn't read it closely or he didn't, you know, whatever, or he's just trying to pull a fast one on the court. But, sir, you don't understand the case you're looking at. Um, you don't understand the case. I, I just don't. Oh, my God. Um, and the tiny hat is bothering me. Uh, a bowler hat. It's not a bowler hat. It's like this pointy hat. Um, so this is also a good point. I don't think a church in the picture of the background is not appropriate, uh, considering where the crime happened, a little tone deaf. I don't think anyone's going to I don't think anyone's going to pay attention to that. But if they do, I mean, uh, but good spotting, Joy. The problem with the verdict under Taylor that we have at this point is we don't know which act the jury may have found uh, unanimously. And the thing is that Godoy says they don't have to find them. They don't have to find them unanimously so long as all of the paths are valid routes to conviction. They don't have to be unanimous on which one. Um I know it was a play on his name. I... Uh, or whether it was unanimous. Uh, and the other problem is that the special prosecutor specifically argued in closing that the jurors are able to find uh, six can find one act and six can find another. And that's so there exactly was no what Godoy that says there be is unanimity. Uh, that is precisely what Taylor is saying in paragraphs 9 and 16. No, it is not. He doesn't understand um he doesn't understand this and it, it's so frustrating it's so frustrating to see him misapplying all of this that there has to be a finding of unanimity on that particular theory now in taylor there were four alternatives and so the court discussed there were four alternatives and it was more confusing with the use of andor when there were more than two um, that court did involve four alternatives. Two of those alternatives involved CYFD policies, which they said could not be a le legally adequate basis to convict. However, that was not the entire holding uh, Justice uh, V. Hill announced, which was that any time, and they criticized the use of Andor and said courts uh, should abandon, should consider abandoning the use of that instruction altogether. Uh, what and they said is they anytime you have that. two or more. They did say that, but they were saying it in the specific context of the child abuse statute, which is a very, very 
different thing. Um, one of the most important skills about being a lawyer is you have to read the entire case and understand it. You can't just read for good quotations. You have to read the entire case. Or going back to console, that there should be separate instructions to guide the jury to a, a unanimous decision. Now, that that is how Justice Vigil announced uh, Taylor in the Supreme Court. The Godoy opinion was not overruled in Taylor. Now, the court did discuss Godoy being a fundamental error review because in that case, there was not a specific preservation. The state in their response indicated that our only objection at trial to the instructions was the use of the word uh, reckless as opposed to negligent. But as we cited in our reply, and we had to get the trial tapes to, to delineate that, that was not our only objection. Up here. In fact, Ms. Barrera uh, specifically made the unanimity uh, objection, and, and it's laid out in our reply. Um, Godoy involved a case where there were a uh, trafficking charge and a step-down possession charge for cocaine. So what he's doing here is he's got to... Um... He's got to differentiate between uh, Godoy and his current situation. He's got to distinguish this case, and he's having a very difficult time with this. Um, he's having a very difficult time. So there in Godoy, the, the court said on fundamental error review, we don't find an issue with the jury not being given separate instructions. Because there's a step-down instruction, and, we, and we, we had one in this case. The step-down instruction is very detailed and explains to the jury, if you don't find the lead charge, then you go to the next step-down. So um, there's other people sort of noting uh, that they're a little lost. So basically, there's two... What Godoy says is perfectly fine is if you have two alternatives with like an and or or whatever where both of them are legally valid ways to get a conviction. And so uh, in this case, you know, it's did she, was she negligent by loading a gun or was she negligent by not checking the gun, right? Those two possibilities are both valid ways for the, the court or for a jury to reach a conviction. Whereas the problem in Taylor, which differentiates it, the reason why Taylor resulted in a reversal was that Taylor said basically um, Taylor had an and or, but because of that, it mixed in elements that on their own were insufficient to uh, result in a conviction, which raises the possibility that a jury could convict because they find one of those things, but not well enough to actually uh like not enough to actually convict so does the judge draft the jury instructions yes do the attorneys review and approve them the attorneys review and often um often argue about it who's taylor taylor is the name of the um uh, of the case of one of the two cases so so in that case on a fundamental error review the, the court said the jury didn't need any additional um, guidance because they must have found cocaine. So they found the possession charge in Godoy, uh, but they didn't find the trafficking. Um, but they did have language in that case where there are different acts, there are different ways in which uh, crime can be committed. That's when, Your Honor, we are in this case, uh, which Taylor talked about, when there's separate theories and those have to be unanimous. So that's why I assert, I submit to the court that Godoy is not applicable that the principle of Taylor is applicable, that we need a unanimous verdict on the specific act. And that's and so not Judge, what I, Taylor I submit says. because of that, and none of us had the Taylor opinion at the time, but now that we do, I think this is a reason that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed should be entitled to a new trial. So all of this is just getting the law wrong. That follow right. Taylor and they track Taylor's language. That is the basis of his argument. unanimous verdict is, I got on the, the specific law wrong. act alleged, that she alleged to have committed. Thank you, Ms. Morrissey. Um, I'm just going to say, um, do you see what the judge did there? Judge asked 
zero questions. The judge was just like, thank you for talking. Um, over to you, prosecutor. Do you want to have any response to this? Like, do you want to respond to this? Um, if I am bulls, I am feeling very bad about how that went. Because if I'm bulls, I want to be asked questions. I want the court to be like, so the court was completely disengaged, completely like, okay, that was a lot of words you just said. Are you done with words? Because somebody else is gonna, you know, is gonna happen. Um, and Apple Silver asks a good question. Ian, are these cases even retroactive anyway? Yes. Uh, because they're not really retroactive. They're saying this is what the law always has been, which isn't a thing that makes sense to anybody who hasn't been indoctrinated by law school and the legal profession, but it is, yeah. So Bowles had a lot of words, and the judge is just like, you done? And, every, like, it happens to every lawyer, but it's a bad place Your to Honor, be. Your Honor, in response... First, I want to point out that the she's really bad at like hide your she's just like, your honor, I have to respond to this BS like <laughs> you don't need to, to quite go there. Um, she's just like. Take the win with some dignity. Uh, she just, she's just like, I am so sick of this shit. Like what? I could have been sleeping in today. Why do I have to respond to this? The, the defense's initial motion was two pages long. Uh, so we did our very best to respond and kind of try to anticipate what we would be seeing in their reply. This is some shade. She's saying, hey, um, they should have actually told us what they were going to argue, and they didn't. Um, they gave us like two pages that basically just says, um, you know, this case exists and therefore we win. So she's like, come on, that's that's not fair. Um, if if. Certainly, I would invite the court, if the court is is remotely inclined to grant this. Um, if the court is remotely inclined to grant this, it's like, this is some bullshit. But if the court doesn't think it's bullshit, um, then oh, then we we want more time to respond to the stuff that they brought up for the first time in oral argument because they didn't actually lay any of this out. Now, the problem is, is that she has a hard time complaining about this because the whole trial, she did this like the, the whole trial. She kept most of her questions or a lot of critical questions for, for redirect. So it's like, yeah, okay. Now what's going to save her is that the court, is already way ahead of her on the, like, I don't need more time on this. I don't need extra written submissions. I'm just going to pump this into space and that'll be it. <clears throat> to request additional briefing because uh, I, to a certain degree, I feel like we got a little bit cheated uh, out of an opportunity to fully respond because the initial motion Oh, uh, was you think that so, now, huh? So threadbare. I've never seen a motion for a new trial that was two pages. Uh, so that's also a little bit of shade. And the reason why that's a little bit of shade is to let Hannah know. I think that she's talking to Hannah there. She's basically going, Hannah, um, your lawyer, your great lawyer who's here to save you, um, filed two pages. Like, really? Like, is that what you are, I guess, not paying for? Because um, I would be pissed if I was looking to uh, to get out of jail. And it's like, 
Yeah, I, I did two pages. That's it. Well, having said that, in response to Mr. Bowles's argument, I want to point the court to, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, I want to point the court to Taylor paragraph 14, uh, where the court in Taylor um, indicates. She's reading right now. I, I'm just going to read it for the record, if that's. Also, she looks when she says she's got a little bit of a cold. I think she's actually feeling pretty miserable uh, based on sort of her demeanor here. I think she's doing this through like a, a massive, um, a massive this sucks. So uh, I think it right now sucks for her to be alive. So that's what she's doing. It's okay. Uh, using and or to separate two terms such as A and or B invites the reader to choose only A, only B, or both A and B. Thus, the reader is presented with only three options when and or is used to separate two terms. That's exactly what happened in Ms. Gutierrez's case. Uh, is exactly what Taylor described in that very short paragraph. Taylor then goes on to discuss the very complicated scenario that happened in the Taylor case in terms of the jury instructions. So the court goes on and says, however, opposed to and or adding an additional proposition C can leave the reader guessing whether and or is intended to be placed between all propositions or only some of the propositions. And that was really the problem in, in Taylor. The problem so in she, Taylor was they went be She understands Taylor, but she's having a hard time explaining Taylor. Um, now, the good thing is, is that they are in front of a smart judge. This judge, I mean, there's lots of things you can criticize this judge for. However, this judge is not stupid. This judge is not dumb. This judge is not... Um, this judge is not somebody who shortcuts things or whatever else. So, um, I think the judge is already here, right? Is already like, I understand the, um, you know, I understand the circumstances. I understand this case. So her explanation being bad. And I say it's a bad explanation because if you have a judge who didn't read Taylor, and just read Bowles's filing, um, the judge might not understand what she's talking about. And if she was trying to explain this to a class, like a first-year law school class, I don't think the first-year law school class understands what the F she's talking about yet. So you got to explain this like the judge didn't read the case. And I don't think she's doing that, but she gets lucky because, she, or she knows her judge. Like Beyond and or separating two alternatives, and they had four alternatives. And in She's reading the most confusing part of the case, and it's like, this will clear it. Um, and yes, that is fair, but I'm not like, I'm... I'm a lawyer, but I'm not like this perfect In addition lawyer. to it's that, easier to do this the from behind. acts that were outlined in those alternatives were just legally insufficient to support a conviction. This is you the know, critical For example, point. this is the key. If point. a daycare worker, a childcare worker, doesn't follow CYFD uh, policies or training, that in and of itself is not enough to 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 satisfy. Uh, this the is the elements of the offense of that child abuse charge. Uh, so we certainly don't have that element in this case. Um, in this case, we had two um, alternatives in 12A for the jury to consider, both of which were absolutely sufficient for involuntary manslaughter. It's my recollection that in closing, what I invited the jury to do, uh, and this is a little bit different than what Mr. Bowles is suggesting to the court, what I explained to the court is you've got 12 
and 12A. And between instruction 12 and 12A, she's correct. The, the, she's just boring. Is, uh, un, unanimity is not required. I don't believe that I suggested to the jury that the options within 12A did not require unanimity. Uh, that's my recollection of my closing. I can see Mr. Bowles shaking his She is correct, and Mr. Bowles doesn't understand the point she's making. So she's saying you can convict on 12A and 12B, and that it is acceptable to convict with half, pe half the people saying 12A and half the people saying 12B. That is what I remember her saying. Um, whereas, and what she's distinguishing is that if you find neither A nor B, but the rest of the things, could you convict on that? And the answer to that is, um, no, I don't think she said that. Head, uh, we, we haven't had the, the, the reason that when Mr. Lewis filed his, uh, response and he indicated that that the defense didn't object to this was because he didn't have uh, the benefit of the audio and the transcript. Uh, and that's one of my concerns is the defendant uh, had the benefit of the audio and the transcript when they filed their initial two-page motion, but they certainly haven't shared it with us. Uh, so <laughs> that's... Um... That's kind of petty snark because she could have ordered it herself, but it's like, why aren't you sharing? Why are you holding this back? Um, so, yeah. So I'm happy to provide uh, additional briefing on this if the court uh, thinks that that's necessary. Um, in terms of the unanimity issue and the Godoy case, Taylor actually, as Mr. Bowles pointed out, upholds uh, Godoy and the argument yes. that, or, or the principle, that unanimity is not required when there are two alternatives. And in this case, we had two alternatives, that being 12 and 12A. Um, so while I appreciate the fact that the Taylor case may give guidance in the future, uh, to how to properly construct jury instructions that have and or separators, the Taylor case actually has language that specifically supports what we did in this trial. And she's there right. only being two options in 12A separated by and or. So I'm a little confused uh, about what the defense thinks the strength of their argument is, because when you read paragraph 14, Taylor actually is supportive of the way that we did it in Ms. Gutierrez's case. Uh, so for those reasons, we would object and we would ask the court to deny uh, defendant's motion. And if the court has any specific questions for me or any concerns, I'm happy to address those. Thank you. Reply. Uh, yes, Judge. Um, first, Judge, the opinion in Taylor does say in paragraph 9 and 16, it doesn't limit that language to, to four propositions. The specific language in 9 and 16 is the consul case when two or more different or inconsistent acts. That's specifically yes, but stated. so long as and that's what one of them Justice is Justice Vigil is saying in Taylor is that the unanimity principle is the problem. Uh, the unanimity principle as to which different act. So, it so he's saying that the unanimity principle, that Taylor over what, like overrules the principle that you can convict with a jury that says half say this path to conviction and half say that path to conviction. That's not what Taylor says at all. He's mischaracterizing it. He doesn't understand the law or he's getting it wrong. Uh, Mangoes is saying, Ian, did you read the Taylor ruling in a live stream? I did. Um, he's getting this wrong. It doesn't matter if it's four or six or eight or two. It's the idea that under our constitution, there has to be a unanimous verdict as to the specific act. No, that is not what Godoy says. Um, also, I'm kind of wanting to make a little church hat now. <laughs> Maybe I should make... Uh, 
Maybe I should make one and just sell it for uh, the Extra Life fundraiser. That is the issue that Taylor is stating. Now, I agree that Ms. Uh, Morrissey is correct in, in 14 that they talk about two or more, A or B and C. Now, the reason why they were going into that is because they were emphasizing that here we not only have two, we have four, which made it more confusing. So it was more confusing in Taylor uh, under those specific alternatives, but it didn't change the principle they're announcing. Now, I wish we could actually see all of the lawyers at this point and the judge, because I'm betting the judge has a face that just says, stop talking. Like that, that is what I'm expecting this to be. Which is that when two or more, it has to be unanimous and it has to be separated. And, and Ms. Morris, it is hard to remember exact language, but but she specifically said in closing, six of you can find one act and six in another. And we have those tapes. And that is exactly uh, what us, she did you know, say, request but those not, tapes so we can get that transcribed in proper fashion. once then and we can make that part of the record. But we can get that transcribed, sir. This is your application. This is your application. You should have brought this transcribed. Why don't you have that? It's like, um, this is like walking into class in elementary school. Like you're in grade four or whatever. And the, uh, the, and it's like, well, teacher, I could get my homework done. And it's like, but you were supposed to have your homework done. You got to have this crap ready to go. You want to rely on a transcript. You got to have the transcript. Um, that That's how that works. You can't just be like, ah, take my word for it, judge. We're fighting over, um, we're fighting over what's in it, but take my word for it. No, bring the homework. Bring uh, this. Uh... That. The problem is this jury was invited to find a non-unanimous act. Yes, and, and that's okay. That's what Godoy that's the, says is the okay. Problem that Taylor announced. No, that is not. You are wrong, sir. All right. Thank you, counsel. So I do. All right. Thank you, counsel. I have no questions and I don't need any time to think about this. I'm just launching in on a uh, thing because I had made my decision before any of you walked in based on reading the case law. Um, and you had an opportunity to convince me that you had an argument, but nobody did that. I agree that your um, motion was very sparse and it just focused, your motion for a new trial was very sparse and it just focused on the and or, and because we had a jury instruction in and or, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Gutierrez was entitled to a new trial. It wasn't. Sir, you didn't do the homework. The homework was bring yourself an argument. And I'm just going to say, like, I am, I am writing a memo with a, um, with a five page limit on it. It's got a five page limit. And I have taken a long time writing it because you got to get things under five pages. It's hard. You've got, but I don't think he was at a two page limit. Um, he wasn't like at a, a limit of two pages. He, he had more pages and most legal writing is not, it's very rare with legal writing that you come in at substantially under the page count. Typically you're coming in at very close to the page count. Um, like when I went, you know, when you're going to like the court of appeal and they say you got 30 pages, you're probably using 28 pages to 30 pages, somewhere in that realm. Uh, and much more likely to be 30 than 28. Um, this is just like, and she's like, did you really like until your reply where you flushed out, um, um, things, issues that you had already stated um, regarding the uh, unanimity aspect of things. Um, I have read uh, Taylor. I've read Gaudet. I've uh, read Consul. I've read uh, very many cases. I'm very aware of what occurred at trial. I'm very aware of the discussions that... 
<laughs> what she's saying right now is I did all of the, I did the homework that you guys didn't do. When she says, I read Taylor, I read Godoy. I read like, she's like, I did the fucking homework guys. I don't need the transcript. I went over it. Um, she's a little annoyed that she is peeved. It occurred on, on um, regarding the jury instructions. And I am denying your motion, Mr. Bowles, because I do not think that uh, Taylor requires a new trial. Uh, in this case, I think that the uh, issues in this correct. case, uh, the jury instruction in this case are distinguishable distinguishable from what uh, what happened in Taylor. I'm not going to, um, I'm going to provide a written order outlying my reasons so that there's no misstatements of what I'm uh, to make an oral determination. So I'm going to do a written order, but I wanted to let you know that I'm denying your motion for a new trial. I will put it in an order. You should get that on Monday. And um, we are staying the course on the sentencing. Yes, Your Honor, and I had one additional request to the court in my motion, which was, and if the court were to address this at sentencing or to address it now, which was to consider release of Ms. Gutierrez-Reed uh, pending uh, an appeal and a writ that we would take for guidance from the appeals court and Supreme Court. And I just wanted to add to that, she didn't have any violations uh, pending trial. Okay, let's go back here. I'm just going to go back a little bit. Um... Yes, Your Honor, and I had one additional request to the court in my so, motion. 35 was, seconds, 17 minutes, 35 seconds. And if the court were to seconds. address this at sentencing or to address it now, which was to consider release of Ms. Gutierrez-Reed uh, pending uh, an appeal and a writ that we would take for guidance from the appeals court and Supreme Court. And I just wanted to add to that, she didn't have any violations uh, pending trial. She takes care of her father, who has been diagnosed with leukemia. Um, she works um and she has been in counseling so she hasn't done anything wrong she's not a danger or a flight risk and i think there's um an appellate issue that we have stated that we we will raise and a potential supreme court writ and i, I just think it's unfair if there's any chance of, of the court of appeals or supreme court seeing it differently that she served her whole sentence uh on the chance that it could be reversed. So I'm just asking the court to consider that based on all those grounds and the fact that she hasn't had any violations. That was four seconds more than a minute. Four seconds more than a minute. It's your client's liberty at stake. Um, did you want to argue this for more than a minute? Um, Jesus Christ, dude. Um, gee, oh my God. Um, <laughs> and here's the thing. She's already denied your motion for a new trial. So she's not going to grant bail based on your motion for a new trial you need to actually bring an argument bring like you know and some of his points are good arguments it's just they need to be fleshed out what does she do for work when does she do for like you know um you gotta actually you gotta argue this stuff like you know your honor she's working she's been employed at the location since wherever i've contacted her employer her employer indicates that uh, you know she was a good worker when she was there she's welcome back there as soon as she's released you know she uh this you know she's gainfully supporting her community her father's got leukemia let's go through that he requires constant care because he's in you know, medical distress. She's got to change his bedpans. She prepares meals. She, all of this stuff, like explain all of it in detail. Explain it like you give it. And the, the winning line, like the absolute winning, and it's a winning line, but it's a winning line for, 
you know, for the state is she didn't do anything wrong. Don't ever tell the court she didn't do anything wrong when there's a dead body. There is a dead body here, Mr. Bowles. Do not say she didn't do anything wrong. You've got to be very careful about your phrasing. And what you say is she did not violate the terms of her release. She followed the terms of her release to the letter, including, and you name some ones that are like particularly annoying to, um, you know, to follow. Like if she had to report to a probation officer or a bail supervisor every day, you say, hey, and you know, like she's employed. What is she employed doing? Because you better not be saying she's employed as an armorer. Like, hopefully she's got a job at like a car wash or, uh, you know, a landscaping place or, a you know, a McDonald's, whatever it is, right? Make a pitch for why she should be released. How much is she able to put up cash? How much cash? Is she able to, like, are you suggesting she's on monitoring? Are you suggesting that she is like, what is your actual proposal here? Because if I'm if I'm Hannah and I watch my lawyer do this, I am pissed. So I would be super pissed. And I got to do this. Thank you so much, uh, Patty Hoffman, for the pro bono fund contribution. Hopefully we can get there. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I um, I read somewhere she was working at a tattoo place. Yeah, go on about that. Like she's, she's working at a tattoo place. What is she doing? Is she an apprentice at a tattoo place? If she is an apprentice at a tattoo place, I'd be bringing in, like, here are samples of her work. Here are, like, you know, this kind of thing, right? Like, show that she's actually, like, she's learned to use the autoclave. She's taking, I mean, maybe don't go, <laughs> don't get into the autoclave uh, now that I think about it. Don't get into, like, the, she's taking all the safety requirements for uh, for all of this. Um, but, you know, you could just say, like, here are samples of her work. Here is, um, you know, here is, you know, here's her hours, like the hours that she's working. Um, name all of this stuff. Like, tell us what it is. Um, and I mean, she maybe she does great work. If you don't, like, need somebody to check the uh, the tattoo machine for what color ink they put in it beforehand or like double check the spelling of things cuz um <laughs> um i feel like being a tattoo artist is one of those things that you really need to be uh, careful with uh the more i think about it the less i'm like yeah that's that's a good thing cuz it's like um I'm like huh Hmm, that that's not good. Carelessness in tattooing is um is not good. Uh <laughs> you know, whoops, uh just a little extra line there. That's no biggie. Um I got to say I got no tattoos cuz I am terrified that if I get a tattoo, I'm just going to um uh, I'm going to hate it afterwards. So Maybe one day I'll get one, but, um, yeah, um, no regrets. Yeah. Tattooing is actually really an attention to detail thing. So, uh, all right, let's, so yeah, he, um, he pitched for like a solid minute on all of this. Miss Marcy. Well, we do oppose, uh, Ms. Gutierrez's release. Um, I <laughs> she's like, I'm not really prepared for this because I didn't actually think he'd push this. Um, uh, uh, are you, are you sure? Like, do I seriously have to respond to this? Um, yeah, I, 
if this were like a motion to review conditions of release, um, I certainly would have been able to address my concerns with regard to Ms. Gutierrez and potential release. Um, I, I'm opposed. Like, hey, if you'd actually done the proper homework, um, we could talk. She's like, I could actually, we could make an argument if you'd sent me a full proposal for release and not just this. And then she's going to really dunk on him to it does the court want me to go into um I, I mean i actually asked mr bowles she's like i'm opposed to it do i actually have to explain this hey sarah i will have to get back to you uh i owe you some responses so i will have to get back to you but yeah um so now she's gonna now she's gonna really dunk on bowls for for uh proof of Ms. Gutierrez's employment history uh, during the time that the case was pending and any counseling and treatment that she has uh, completed or participated in. To date, I don't believe he's provided me anything. Uh, so while- So basically she was supposed to do all of this stuff while on bail, like treatment and whatever else, I asked for the proof that she's done that to confirm that she did all of the things she was supposed to do while on bail. I I got nothing. So, um, how? Like, how does he say that she's followed all the rules if she can't? And the thing is, is that when you go to these, like, all of these treatment programs... They they give you per, like they give you a receipt. They give you because they know that everyone who's there or a lot of the people who are there are there because they're court ordered, right? Um, people don't take anger management recreationally. Like nobody's like, hey, it's not like you know taking a class on like macrame or something where you're like, this could be fun, you know, or pottery. Nobody goes to anger management just because they think it would be fun. So they give certificates, they give sign out, like they, bleh, I got a hair in my mouth. That's not fun. Um, they, they give you like sign-ins for your attendance every day. And let's say your client, um, let's say your client who, you know, your client is a dumb client, right? So your client, um, your client loses the certificate. You can call the place up and be like, hey, um, my stupid client lost the certificate. Can I get another copy? And they'll be like, sure. It happens all the time because clients lose things. Um, this is not difficult. Um, and so the lack of, you know, the lack of submitting anything kind of suggests maybe she didn't do the things. That's what the suggestion here is, is like, did she really follow all the rules or did she just not get caught breaking them? Mr. Bowles wants to make these statements to the court this morning. These are things that I requested from Mr. Bowles, I think, over a week ago. I did it almost immediately after the trial. So the reason why she's asking for these things after the trial is she's like, I could consider release. I could consider this on sentencing. Um, tell me the things that will cut your client a break. And Bowles didn't do it. I can tell you if I get a prosecutor saying, hey, can you confirm that your client did the treatment and my client did the treatment? I, um, I, I go and I, I get the, the documents like right away. That I could be thoughtful in terms of coming up with a sentencing recommendation at the sentencing on April 15th, and I've received absolutely nothing. In terms of uh, <laughs> Ms. Gutierrez's uh, full compliance with her conditions of release, I, I think there are some arguments to be made there if the court wants me to make them now. I think there are some arguments to be made there. Um, I think the argument is, she also has charges for bringing a gun into a bar. So, um, you know, 
Mm. She's like, are you sure you want to do this? The jury found uh, Ms. Gutierrez read guilty. She is incarcerated at this point. She's facing incarceration time. Keep in mind, there was a death that the jury determined was caused by her. So I am not releasing her. All right. Thank you. We are in recess. And the thing is, is that was exactly what she said before. So if you want to come and ask for bail again, and you should, like, I think it is entirely reasonable to ask for bail again. Like that is entirely reasonable as an ask, but, um, do your homework, do your, do the work to say, how can somebody get bail? And I'd be coming in with like, let's talk about the cases where somebody has gotten bail post trial, where there's a death. This person got bail post trial, where there's a murder. This person got bail post trial, where there's a manslaughter. This person got bail post trial, where they killed two people in some horrific accident. This per like, and you just say, like, it is not the law that a death in and of itself is enough to deny release. So, you know, assuming that he can find those cases, I assume those cases exist. And you come in and you you make the argument like you're a freaking lawyer and not like you're a guy at a coffee shop going, eh, this guy sounds like he's, you know... He sounds like he's like walked into a restaurant and he's trying to argue his way into a free soup or something like that. Not like he's trying to. Ar That's not true. I have seen people at restaurants arguing for a free soup or like a free whatever argue way better than this. So. Okay, my mic has now come unplugged twice today. That's not great. Um, hopefully this time I fixed it so it's not super tinny. But um, I also need to run. Um, uh, Crazy Cat Queen. Bulls pro bono is too expensive. Ian's, on the other hand, is priceless. I recently became friends with a retired public defender and told her I appreciated her work. She was really surprised. You're the reason I have a different take on defense attorneys. Appreciate you, Ian. Thank you so much. And people don't have enough regard for defense lawyers because it is an important job. And as much as I, you know, as I think Hannah did something wrong, she deserves better than what she's getting. It is frustrating to see this kind of like, eh, whatevs, like, eh. And yeah, I mean, the thing is about the unclear path to conviction, it's like both of those two things are sufficient. So, um, and the example I give is like, let's say me and, you know, uh, me and Frank, I'm going to stop picking on Bob here. Uh, let's say me and Frank uh, decide to commit a robbery together. And so together... Um, we bring in a gun and we decide amongst ourselves, like we have, and we, we're really dumb. Like we put this in text messages beforehand. We say, if there, you know, we're not going to leave any witnesses, but we only have one gun between us. And so we go in, we go into the, um, like the jewelry store and, you know, the jewelry store clerk gets shot, but there's some question as to who actually was holding the gun at the time. Well, this is not a problem for, um, this is not a problem for conviction because they can convict me on the murder. If I, you know, if I was holding the gun and shot the jewelry store clerk, that's fine. They can also convict me on the murder if I was there as a party to it. And so the jury doesn't have to agree as to whether or not I was actually the person holding the gun 
or whether I was just the guy who watched the other guy doing the shooting. Right. So, um, the jury, like if you get the jury where half of them think I had the gun and half of them think Frank had the gun, they can still convict me because they're unanimous that I am guilty of murder. It's just, yeah. Um, Zora. So Zora has learned this trick. Uh, Zora has learned that the window exists. And um, so now she will go to the window and she will express opinions about people who are walking by. And this is not a good trick for her to have learned because it results in woof, 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 woof. And let me tell you, at one so a um, couple days ago, I was super tired uh, because I have not been sleeping well. So I decided to take an afternoon nap. And Zora decided that that was the time that she was going to spend windowing. And she had all sorts of opinions about, like, dogs and cats and, you know, mailmen and whatever else. And I had an opinion of I wanted to sleep. But meanwhile, Zora's like, woof, 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 woof. And I'm like, the hell is it? Um, so... I need to find a way to teach Zora to continue to notify me like when someone's on the porch, but not notify me when somebody is walking by and just exists because like people existing in public, they're allowed to do that. I have to tell Zora like that person is allowed, like they're allowed to walk their dog. They're allowed to, they're, they're allowed to just be a person. So yeah. Um yeah. Some people are saying a couple uh feet of aluminum foil on the bottom of the window. It might be a good idea. Um did Mr. Bowles get his law degree in a happy meal? Um I don't think so. I mean yeah. All right. So yeah. So he's unhappy because he's lost. And I think that's the end of this uh, this meeting there. <laughs> um, let's just uh, go to the end there, just so I can. So he's looking real awkward. And she... <laughs> um, was it Curb Your Enthusiasm? Which which uh, which TV show was it that had the quote of um, "I have the worst lawyers," <laughs> like? There's Hannah going. Oh, is that it? Is that it? Like, I, I get to stay in jail because of this crap? Like, um, yeah. Now, I would love to be able to read to you the, um, um, I would love to be able to read to you the full, um, you know, um, uh, details, but I just, I can't because, um, we don't have that order yet. So when that order comes out, it'll show up in either a video or a Monday live stream, but, um, we ain't got it yet. So we're stuck with what we got. All right. Um, can I take Bowles's face down? This is Hannah's face. We got Hannah's face now. Um, so that's all we got now. Um, all right. Now I am going to, uh, I've had a few requests to cover, um, cover something that is, um, I guess a little, little politically contentious. So, um, I will probably get some unsubscribes. I'm probably going to lose view, lose subscribers as a result of this stream. When I cover, um, when I cover politically contentious things, that happens, but um, we'll just, we'll forge ahead anyway, because um, I had some requests to cover it, and um, yeah. All right, so, so this one, um, 
this is a cease and desist, and this is um. Uh, I see people saying, if you tried looking behind the couch? I mean, nobody owes me a subscribership, right? People subscribe or don't if they want to, um, you know, if they want to watch my stuff. But what this is about is this is more um, issues over um, like Sweet Baby Incorporated and this kind of thing. So basically about these consulting firms that are being hired by game companies in order to um, to introduce more sort of variation in their character design. Now, um, people, this is controversial because some people say that these organizations are ruining gaming. And I think that there is an argument that some of the uh, I see people saying no swoop. I'm leaving. OK, I will swoop. Uh, let me swoop. Um, swoop. So some people are saying that these guys are, you know, ruining gaming because they um you know, whatever. And I mean, the thing is, is that gaming, like what content is in it is a preference. So p different people can like different things. But these companies are also really upset about being like identified and having people talk about who they work for. So that's weird. Um, so this is, there's a lot of people fighting over this. And a lot of them are like, I sort of take the position of free speech. You can just talk about whatever and people can decide to buy a product or not based on if they like the product or if they like the product and who it, um, you know, and who it it's connected to. Like I can, oh, and I'm also being told I got to run this. Like, I can boycott something because I don't like, you know, I can boycott Microsoft because I don't like that they have, you know, business dealings with, you know, fictional corp or whatever. Like, that is, that is perfectly, like, acceptable. So, um, this is a cease and desist that is, that was sent to that park place by Black Girl Gamers Incorporated. And so Black Girl Gamers is one of these consulting firms that has been hired by a bunch of different uh, gaming companies. And basically that park place um, has criticized their work and their existence and as well as a bunch of comments. Because one of the things that happens is a lot of these um, a lot of these consulting firms end up hiring people who say stupid and discriminatory things like we hate white men kind of thing. And I mean, I don't think that's a great thing to say, um, especially if your customers include that group, right? So yeah. All right. So please be advised that our firm has been retained. Now I should also note, go check out, um, I think it's, uh, you know, Valhalla uh, had this on his stream. Uh, so go check that out. But um Please be advised that our firm has been retained by Ms. J.N. Lopez, CEO of Black Girl Gamers Incorporated, here and after BGG. As you know, Ms. Lopez and BGG are well known in the gaming community. Our firm was retained because Ms. Lopez uh, made a series of unwarranted and defamatory attacks against her character, or sorry, observed a series of unwarranted and defamatory attacks against her character and reputation made by you and various online commentators who follow or share your views. These false, unwarranted, and defamatory attacks are also directed at BGG. Additionally, Ms. Lopez observed that you have publicly used her name, image, and likeness without her prior authorization on your website. Now, um, you can actually use people's name, authorization, and likeness without their permission for certain purposes. Um, the certain purposes are things like 
you know, you can identify it. Like if I want to talk about, you know, Bill Clinton, I can talk about Bill Clinton and possibly even use a picture, assuming I have rights to the picture or that it's fair use and so forth. So like all of that is fine. Um, you know, so long as it's for commentary and that they're not using it to like as an endorsement, which it doesn't sound like they are because they're actually like they're they're mocking this person. So we demand that you immediately cease and desist from posting or displaying any videos and such or comments about Ms. Lopez and BGG, which is pretty expansive. We demand that by April 5th, uh, 2024, that you remove any and all links and references to videos, i.e. YouTube or Twitch, that comments upon or visually depicts Ms. Lopez and such or the BGG brand. Now, the thing is, is that you're allowed to you're allowed to comment on people. Um, they're not just asking for defamatory posts. They're also asking for every other post. So video commentary and comments posted online that attack Ms. Lopez's moral character and accuse her and BGG of engaging in unlawful and discriminatory hiring and retention practices are hurtful, baseless, and defamatory. The accusations that you levied against Ms. Lopez and BGG are simply untrue and demonstrably false. Okay, now we're getting into like an actual claim of defamation here right so um that now we're getting into like where they're saying something is um you know is is false these defamatory public accusations have resulted in racist sexist and misogynistic communications directed at ms lopez and bgg's public brand uh, these defamatory public accusations have also resulted in various communications directed at Ms. Lopez, threatening violence against her person and the company, resulting in a law enforcement refuse, uh, referral. Now, that can be damaging issues, like issues about damages, but that doesn't necessarily mean, like, people, people make death threats over stupid things. Uh, people make death threats over some of my videos, and it's like, yeah, okay. These reprehensible comments and video posts have damaged Ms. Lopez's personal reputation and placed her in reasonable fear of bodily harm. The false accusation of discrimination levied upon uh, by you has adversely affected Ms. Lopez's personal life and damaged BGG's business reputation and public profile. Now, the thing is, is that you're sometimes allowed to damage, um, you know, damage people's uh, public profile so long as it's truthful. Right. So long as it's truthful, that's that's fine. So um, that that's its own uh, sort of aspects there. Um, so. Please note that this law firm does not attempt to restrict legitimate free speech, and we believe the Internet is an important medium for dissemination of accurate and truthful information and for fair comment on issues of interest. However, the defamatory comments made by you unlawfully encroach upon our, our, our client's rights. And then they continue. This letter puts all on notice that there should be further or should there be further defamatory comments about Ms. Lopez and BGG. We will have no choice but to recommend that our client pursue all legal causes of action, including the filing of a lawsuit to protect our interests. We will pursue both monetary damages and attorney's fees and costs incurred by our client as a result of the legal actions. So, um... What do you do when you get these uh, kind of, you know, kind of claims? Well, um, I mean, the first thing is that this is a cease and desist, which means it's not like a legal filing. It's not actually like you're not required. Um, it doesn't compel you to do anything, but it does let you know that somebody might want to sue you over it. and that um that is an issue of you know that you need to take notice of so i think that they've hired a lawyer on all of this and that they're ready to um you know ready to sort of respond to it um and um there are some you know some questions on what like i don't know whether the things that were said are truthful or not that's going to be a defense if it does go to a lawsuit but um yeah i mean this this might be very interesting as it comes out i'm interested because it's a lawsuit 
Um, I'm not trying to sort of take a side in this one because I kind of feel like there's a lot of toxicity to go around. Um, there's a lot of toxicity sort of circling around and it's most of the time it just makes me kind of tired and kind of like, uh, so, um, that is, um, it'll be interesting. I mean, I've had people sort of wanting me to cover this one. I, I may cover it if it turns into a legal filing, but, um, yeah, that's, um, that's where this is going to be, uh, sort of, and all of this comes about from some comments that were initially, um, you know, um, initially made sort of suggesting that there was a bias in hiring practices. So all of this is going to be a gong show. Um, yeah. And this is, I don't know if it was, um, if it was that either, I do know that there's a game developer that was recorded saying she only hires people that look like her. Not sure. I don't know. I remember that video. I don't know if that was connected to her or not. Um, so, yeah. Uh, where does caffeinated kitty fit into this? Zero percent. This is completely unrelated to caffeinated kitty. Um, this is unrelated to Janet. This is unrelated to any of that. This is just. Um, yeah. So. Um, uh, was this the lady who went on a stream or podcast who said she didn't hire white people just because she believed they make issues or something? I don't know. Um, I don't know if that was her or someone else, but um, yeah, it's like a lot of the stuff. And the thing is, is I haven't gone through every claim that was made, but a lot of the stuff that was being reported on about this particular company um, was like quotes from the person and responses to tweets from these people and like bits off their web page and so forth. So all of this is going to be really interesting. You'll note that they don't identify specific defamatory claims. And that makes it very difficult to piece out whether or not this has any basis to it or not. And so that's that's a problem. I don't know if there's any merit to any of what was said. I don't, you know, and I don't know what's being alleged, but it'll be really interesting to see if this turns into a filing that I think I'm going to, you know, have to do some covering because, yeah, um, that'll be interesting. All right. Um, let us do some super chats and I'm going to swoop and super chat and... Yeah. All right. So there's that. Um, well, only going to have standing if someone tried to get hired and was told they can't be hired because of race, unless they sue, in which case you got standing because you've been sued. Like an easy path to standing in a case is they sued you. So, yeah. Um, all right. Um Mickey, please feed the cat and treats for the pups. The cat looks well fed. Um, I don't think the cat needs me feeding it. And I don't know whose cat it is. So if I start feeding it, now this cat's getting double food. Um, I could cause the cat health problems. That's not, not great. So um, if you're looking for someone to discuss Tate, Romani Romanian TV has a Romanian law degree and can discuss the legal political situation there. Okay, that's a good recommendation. Um, Emma Zay, agree with Against the Tide and a few others. Runkle Terrans is a good name for us chat. Thanks for making legal filings and proceedings easier to understand. Thank you so much, Emma Z. Sandy, thank you for the five gifted memberships. Uh, Dylan Schultz, the Hunger Game prequel had uh, movie had sign of shots. Ooh, I haven't seen it uh, yet. Vez from Quebec, the problem with idiots, they don't know they are. Also true. Uh, K. Rab, during jury instruction uh, discussion, they offered him what he's asking for now. He said, no, he didn't need it. He's terrible in grasping at straws. And in that case, he may be precluded based on, on that. Uh, Rhineman uh, YYC, or Rainman YYC, thank you for the 10 gifted memberships. I keep saying Rhine, but it's Rain. Uh, Rainman YYC, I'm out of the hospital. Yay! Starting community rehab, going to do some rehab by teaching rec therapy, 3D printing, and volunteering with makers making change. That is amazing, Rain Man. Fantastic. 
Um, at some point, I need to make a trip down to Calgary, and if I do, I would love to shake your hand. So we will, uh, yeah. Uh, equality, thank you for the five gifted memberships. Some people are saying, um, what is it? Some people are asking, like, do I have a picture of the cat? The only picture of the cat I have is one that would give away my address if you were um, sufficiently in-depth. So um, I'm not able to do that. So thank you, Equality. Uh, thank you, Jeremy Morton, for the 20 gifted memberships. Much appreciated. And Gray Clouds, can I buy an autographed bone from your cat or dog? Um, I might have to give, like, Zora a bone, let Zora and Potter chew on it so it's got chew marks, and then, like, polish it so that it's not, like, gross. Maybe I could do that. Um, maybe I could do that. Um, all right, so let's talk about the Alberta NDP. Um, now... The NDP is the new Democratic Party, and the Alberta NDP is not um, entirely affiliated with the federal NDP. Um, the Alberta NDP is um, its own sort of thing, and um, I don't have a cat, KPT. The cat is um, cat is somebody else's cat. It's just, yeah. Oh, I got to swoop again. Um, swoop. So the Alberta NDP is, um, they're getting sued and it's causing them some problems. Um, it's causing them some difficulties. So let's talk about that. Um, now the Alberta NDP, Ooh, I got to enlarge this like many times. There we go. Maybe it's readable now. Um, so the Alberta NDP is the party that is not in power now. Um, they had run for, um, they had been out of power for like 40 years and then they won an election because the uh, conservatives in Alberta um, managed to suck real badly for a period. And then after the, um, after that happened, um, the Alberta NDP won and then proceeded to lose since then because the conservatives only lose in Alberta um, when the conservatives only lose in Alberta when they actually piss people off a lot. So, um, all right. Now what is happening? Well, um, the plaintiff, Kaylin Ford, who I don't know, um, I don't know what Kaylin Ford is like who they're, who this is. And I don't, you know, but uh, she is suing at, because the Alberta NDP made um, comments about her as a press release on the Alberta NDP website and on their Twitter feed. So they said something um, about her, which she says is defamatory. And here's the problem is who does she sue? So, unlike other defamation cases where the author and publisher are readily identifiable, the plaintiff notes that there is no reference as to who authored, approved, or otherwise directed the publications in question other than Alberta's NDP and Rachel Notley, which name appears on the press releases. Now, Rachel Notley is the leader of the, um, of the NDP, or was. She's now stepped down. Um, guys, I can't get a cat because I got two very playful dogs who will totally play the cat to like unhappiness. So um, the plaintiff applied before a master to provide advice and direction regarding the individual or entity to be named in the suit in relation to the statements made in the name of the Alberta NDP. So basically she went to court to say, I want to sue somebody. Who, who can I sue? Um, who do I sue? And the respondent, the New Democrats of Canada Association, the federal NDP, applied to be struck from the claim or have the claim summarily dismissed and for costs. Um, so, the uh, but they arrived at a tentative agreement on the eve of the application, thus rendering the application moot. 
So the terms of the verbal agreement stated on the record before the applications judge were that the respondent, the Federal NDP Association, was to have been released from the litigation upon the Alberta NDP designating an individual to be named as the representative for the Alberta NDP and providing an appropriate indemnity agreement for the designated individual in respect of an award of damages in favor of the plaintiff. So what is the problem? Well, the problem is, is that the Alberta NDP doesn't really exist. Um, and they didn't follow through with that arrangement as they didn't provide a, an individual by the deadline and they wouldn't provide the plaintiff with the indemnity agreement. So the Alberta NDP is actually what they call an unincorporated association. Um, so what that means is they're a bunch of people um, who are just like together. So as will be articulated uh, in more detail below, the central issues for the court's determination are as follows. So these are the issues the court has to decide. One, who stands in place of the Alberta NDP for the purpose of litigation? Who is actually the person being sued? Because as an unincorporated association, the government, like the Alberta NDP doesn't exist as a legal entity to be sued. So as an example, um, you guys in the chat, um, let's say somebody gets, let's say somebody comes into the chat and you guys, um, and you guys are mean to them. And that's not how you guys roll. And I really appreciate it. But let's say, um, let's say one of you, like you guys are mean to some person in the chat and that person tries to sue Runkle's chat. Well, you guys as the chat are not a legal entity. You're not suable. Now you could be sued as individuals if they say specifically, you know, one person in the chat, and I don't want to name anyone in the chat here, that, that would be mean. Um, but if they said one person in the chat was particularly mean, they could sue that person. They could maybe sue me, but they can't sue the chat because you don't have a legal personhood. So, yeah. Um, who's liable for any damages? So basically, if the um, if this person wins, who has to pay it? Um, can the federal NDP association be responsible for the actions of the provincial counterpart even though the provincial and federal NDPs are split. Should the court release the federal NDP association from the proceedings and slash or grant summary dismissal? Should the court alter the cost award? And should the court make a Sanderson or Bullock order regarding costs? We're not going to get into what those mean because they just don't matter. Um, so background, the plaintiff filed a statement of claim against numerous parties alleging she was defamed. One of those defendants was the new, uh, the federal NDP and federal NDP says we're not connected. It was the Alberta NDP that, um, that does it. And so they go to court to figure out who is responsible. So, um, basically the Alberta NDP discussed the possibility of naming a representative defendant, i.e. what does this mean? It means we're not an entity but we will name a person that you can sue. And so like, you know, pursuant to the whole chat thing, you could have like gray clouds volunteered their name as somebody I could name. So that person steps forward and says, I am the person you sue for this. And so now the lawsuit is against that specific individual. And then what they would do is basically say, we will compensate that person if they, um, you know, if they run into trouble, right? So that is um, that, you know, if they end up owing the money. So uh, that was the plan, but they don't appear to have done anything else. So who stands in? Who's responsible? So, um, so counsel for the plaintiff made this submission saying, now, in the last, I'll say in the last week, but in the last two hours, Mr. King has reached out to me and advised me that his counsel as now counsel for the provincial body. He has received instructions uh, to effectively appoint a representative for the provincial body. Being an individual person, 
uh, and that there would be an indemnity agreement between the provincial associate or the provincial body and that individual person. What is an indemnity agreement? An indemnity agreement, you will find indemnity agreements in all sorts of things that you um, that you sign um, like as terms of service. And so an indemnity agreement is basically something that says uh, if one party is sued and ends up owing a bunch of money, the second party will compensate them. So um, let's say I, um, you know, let's say that, um, I don't know, somebody famous, uh, Taylor Swift. Let's say Taylor Swift wants to hire me to run an event for her. Um, but I might say, hey, and she's very particular because about how this event runs. I might say, listen, Taylor Swift, um, if if you, um, you know, if you want me to run this to your exact specifications, you need to cover me if I get sued because you've got all the money and I've got none of the money and therefore you should cover me. And so let's assume she agrees and I get sued and I end up owing money. Then I can say, Taylor Swift, you got to pay me the money, right? So, um, yeah, I see people saying, don't say Taylor's name in vain. People get mighty upset. I'm just using her as an example of a person who's got tons of money and might be really particular about how she, um, you know, about how she has things run. Like she was the person who was smart enough to avoid um, any of the FTX crap. She's like, yeah. So uh, also, if Taylor Swift wanted to hire me to run an event, I would be totally down because that would be cool. So um Basically, they're saying like this will solve the problem because then that person will be um, on the hook. And council agreed that that was the issue or that that solved the issue. So the problem facing the plaintiff is that her grievance, broadly speaking, is with the Alberta NDP, which is an unincorporated association. It is common ground that an unincorporated association does not have the legal capacity to sue or be sued. And they cite a bunch of different, you know, cases. An unincorporated, like a corporation, people talk about corporate personhood. Um, corporate personhood is, you know, lots of people get upset. What do you mean a corporation is a person? Well, corporate personhood is actually, in some cases, a good thing. Um, I... I could total like if Microsoft does something against me or Amazon or Walmart or whoever else, um, these are big corporations. If they do something against me, I can sue them, right? I can sue Walmart as an entity. So let's say, um, you know, let's say a, a Walmart truck drives onto my property, does donuts and then drives off. Um, or let's say a Walmart opens up like a factory near me and dumps toxic chemicals onto my property. Um, I can sue the Walmart without having to identify the specific person who had the idea to dump the chemicals. Um, the problem that you run into is otherwise you can't. And this person doesn't know who to sue because she doesn't actually know who made the statement. So... This leaves the plaintiff in the difficult position that it is not clear whom she should name as a defendant in her lawsuit. The federal NDP is a federal political party registered under the Canada Elections Act. Though it is not clear from its brief, it appears that the federal NDP is, an, is also an unincorporated entity that would lack standing to sue or be sued. Its chief agent, however, is the Federal NDP Association, which is a not-for-profit corporation created pursuant to the Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, which does have legal standing to sue and be sued. Okay, so the federal NDP wants out because they say we can't be sued. And the Alberta NDP is registered under the Election Finances and Contributions Disclosure Act, but the mere registration doesn't make them legally an entity. And as an unincorporated association, they can't be sued as a thing. So... All of this is a problem because 
we get into some other issues. The Alberta NDP is the beneficiary of a trust established in 1977 pursuant to a trust deed, i.e., this is where the NDP gets their money, right? This is where they get their money. The trustee of that trust is stated to be the Alberta New Democratic Party Foundation. And so they cite Rule 2.1, which provides that an action may be brought against by or against a personal representative or trustee without naming any of the persons beneficially interested in the estate or trust. It asserts that the plaintiff should have brought her claim against the trustee pursuant to that rule. That's the person you should have sued is our trustee. The difficulty with this, however, is that the Alberta New Democratic Party Foundation appears to itself be an unincorporated association and therefore, like the Alberta NDP, does not have the legal capacity to sue or be sued. Neither the Alberta NDP nor the federal NDP refutes this association. Therefore, this is not of any help to them. The plaintiff notes in her application that the trust deed does not appear to be a valid trust. Um, though the issue is not directly before me, I find this trust arrangement between the Alberta NDP and the Alberta New Democratic Party Foundation both curious and potentially troubling. Anyone capable of holding property in his or her own right is capable of holding property as a trustee. Thus, any capacitated individual or limited company can be a trustee. Because unincorporated associations have no separate legal personality, they're incapable of holding title to property and thus are incapable of acting as trustees. Okay, that's a lot of words. And I know a lot of people are going, why, why so many words? Why are you wording us to death? So I'm going to try to explain the issue. The NDP has a bunch of money. And the question is whether or not they properly have that money if they don't actually have a trustee that is a legal person. So um, there's a bunch of money and they can put a person in there who's got the right to administer this trust, but right now they don't have one. And so they, the NDP has the serious concern of they got to sort this out or else where, like, how do they run this money? So why is she suing? She's suing because she claims she was defamed. I, they don't get into the basics of the defamation, but they need a person who is a person in law, which can either be a real person, like, you know, person or a corporation, which is also a person. Um, and so the judge is like, this is a real problem. How, how, how are you doing this? So, um, the court gives them, I'm going to skip through to the end because there's a lot of words in this. There's a lot of words. Um, so many words. And I don't think anybody wants to follow all of the words right now. Um, I could do a video. I could do a live stream just covering this one and it would take a long time. And also, I am starting to, um, I got zero sleep. I have barely eaten and, um, my glass of scotch is empty and therefore I am starting to feel it. So, um, what does the court order? So I'm landing this plane. Um, what does the court order? The Alberta NDP is directed within 30 days, the date of these reasons to provide to the plaintiff, the name of an appropriate individual to act as litigation representative. So a representative defendant to the Alber of the Alberta NDP and such individual must be someone who was present in the Alberta NDP at the time the alleged defamatory statements were made. So they have to pick somebody who can be sued. Um, people are telling, why do I have, why do I have to order donuts? I, I kind of want donuts now, but why do I have to order donuts? Okay. So, oh, because I mentioned doing donuts. Um, Damn it. <laughs> so basically the Alberta NDP has to provide a person to be sued. That person also needs, they also need to show a litigation representative. And why do they have to show a litigation representative for this? 
or uh, why do they have to show an indemnification agreement? Well, because otherwise, if they just pick a person and they don't have an indemnification, then what they can do is they can pick a person who has no money and no assets. So they can just be like, hey, um, this homeless guy who was a member of the NDP, he's our litigation representative. And so we're going to you can sue this person who literally owns like nothing except a sign that says homeless, please give. Um, and then that pretty much defeats the claim because they pick, they say, Oh yeah, you can sue this like no money person that we got to pick out of a hat. That's not going to be fantastic. So um, instead they have to, like the Alberta NDP has to provide an indemnification agreement so that if they get a, you know, a, if they get a damage award and the court says, we don't know if there's going to be an award yet. That's a question for down the road. But if they get a damage award, then the Alberta NDP has to provide that. Um, Such indemnity agreements shall not be canceled, terminated, or altered without the approval of the court on notice to the other parties, including the plaintiff. You want to cancel that agreement? You have to get our permission first. And the other side gets to argue that you are that you are not allowed to do it. The party shall return to me before and uh, before me within 45 days to confirm that this has been done. Federal NDP applications to strike the claim against it or for summary judgment are dismissed. Prior costs award of the applications judge is reversed. And so we got to pick new costs. And the correctness of the application judge's costs award is not relevant. Um, however, had the substantive finding not been reversed, the court would allow the cost appeal and revise the costs amount significantly. Um, and we don't need to issue Sanderson or Bullock orders, which I'm not going to go into right now because, yeah. Gray Cloud says, what kind of donuts do you like? I typically like jelly donuts. Um, um, honey crullers are sometimes good. There was a place that did... Um, uh, there's a place that went out of business, but they used to do a um, uh, like a jelly donut, but they did um, like a jelly donut that was very tart. Um, I forget which berry it was, but it was a very sort of tart berry. So there was sweetness to it, but it was also kind of, uh, yeah, and um, they were so good. Everywhere just does donuts that are like super, super sugary. And the um, the tartness was really nice with the sugar. So I wish there was another place that did that. Uh, one day, one day I need to learn um, how to do this, like how to make jelly donuts. I don't think it was lingonberry. I think it was, um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Gooseberry um gooseberries and it was really good so um but yeah i don't know how to make um i don't know how to make donuts i should learn how to make donuts um the other thing mrs runkle keeps asking me to learn to make and i need to surprise her by learning to make um is to um what is it um i need to learn to make uh, greek lemon potatoes because I can tell you that um, Mrs. Runkle loves Greek lemon potatoes, and I don't know how to make them, so I should figure that out. Um, but yeah, um, somebody. All right, so um, yeah, thank you guys, and I'm gonna land this plane right now, um, and. I will see you guys. Um, oh, wait, I got a few super chats. Uh, Marion, you're a funny, gifted lawyer who makes a lot of us feel like we're not morons in the legal sense. Thank you. Uh, Jackie Lynn, there are dog-friendly cat breeds out there. My favorite is Maine Coons, but they're high maintenance for new cat parents because of grooming. Thank you. Um, Yellow Pill NP, I'm going to sue the law elves. Thank you. Nikki Crayons, Pigeon, thank you. And Stuart Tamanaha, thank you for the membership. And Grey Cloud saying, what kind of donuts do you like? Well, thank you so much. All right. I am going to wrap this up and see you guys uh, next time.